On this day, it's March 11th, 2013. I hear the rounds start cracking off from behind me. Turn my head around and sure enough, one of these dudes was ripping into our group from like 15, 20 feet away. An ideal target of opportunity. The most vulnerable that we would ever be. Dudes are dropping, dudes are scrambling. I know what I'm supposed to do, but I see one of our infantrymen frozen like deer in headlights. 18 year old kid, first deployment, and he's just standing there staring at this guy, 25, 20 feet in front of him. I take some aggressive steps towards him. We go chest to chest and I kind of rotate my back towards the gunner. And that was when I was hit for the first time, top of my right leg. And then I feel a couple more impacts to my legs. There's a rifle laying next to me. I take some horribly placed shots at this shooter. I don't even come close. And then eventually one of my teammates, he smokes this dude. So then now the initial threat's been dealt with. And now we're in a gunfight all around our perimeter. Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He spent 15 and a half years and is still currently on active duty uh, in special forces, i.e. Green Berets within the United States Army. He thus far has been awarded a silver star, three purple hearts, three bronze stars. He's the author of a phenomenal book called Objective Secure, which is on the desk and we're going to get into. He's the owner of Precision Components, which train trains, advises, and assists folks to unlock 100% of their potential. The Dropkick Murphys wrote Shipping Up to Boston for his fucking walkout song, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Nick. Rage against the machine, Lavery. Thanks for having me, brother. Great intro. Yeah, thanks for coming. Well uh, done. Thanks, man. Uh, the most burning question I have is, why are you so goddamn tall? Shit. You know, because there's there's a need, right? Like nobody needs to be as big as you are. Why are you that big? It's a fair question. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I don't think anyone in my family knows. I'm a bit of an oddball. Really? Uh, yeah, we do family photos. I'm definitely the guy in the back that's towering <laughs> over the rest of my family. Yeah, I guess I got lucky. My father's side is, is Irish. They're all relatively tall and lean. And then my other half is all Italian. They're more shorter and stocky. Yeah. And I kind of ended up got getting the best of both, huh? Yeah, you know. Are, are any of your siblings that way? I mean, even close? I have one younger sister. I mean, she's tall. Yeah. Uh, not quite, you know, 6'6 six, six tall, but yeah. she's tall and lean. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what is the most Boston thing about you? The most Boston thing about me? Uh, I, mean, I guess I'd say probably just the way I talk. Yeah. You know, my vernacular, my accent, which actually this is quite dull compared to <laughs> if you're what, home. what it was. And then, yeah, when I go yeah. back up north and I spend some time with my buddies, yeah. especially if you have a couple beers, like forget about it. No one from the south would have a clue as to what I'm yeah. saying. So I'm, I'm curious about that. I, you know, before we started, I mentioned I just went to Boston a few months ago. Love the, love the town. Love everything about it. What I found was weird is that there, there's like pockets of really thick Bostonian accents, sure. and then there's other spots where it, like, it doesn't sound any different than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it. W do you know kind of why the or what the rhyme or reason is? Is it like the more kind of traditional? blue collar areas or are they typically the thicker accents and the more like urban progressive spots or less or what like what is it with that yeah my guess is that is that we're you know a lot of the migrants all kind of populated towards and having that culture historic background like Southie, which i spent quite a bit of time there it's like historically irish the yeah. irish would come over and they would all just migrate to Southie. the north end of boston is historically italian so you got these different cultures that are coming over and they're all kind of Know, conglomerated in the same areas so while they all have you know a massachusetts accent you know perhaps there's just that little bit of a yeah. of a flair to it yeah i got you so speaking of which i'm going to do conduct a little experiment all right so i'm going to show the camera the word i want you to pronounce that <laughs> this is the experiment you were yeah. talking about idea all right uh this is the other word <laughs> ka all right so <laughs> here's what i don't get all right you you clearly know how to pronounce an a and an r Right. Uh, just flip-flopped, yeah. right? So why, why is A sound like an R when you're from where you're from, but an R sounds like an A? Uh, you know, Help me with that. <laughs> it really is just dependent on where the letter is in the word, right? Like I can say the word red, 
Yeah. It sounds probably very similar to the way you say yeah. it. But if it's at the end of the word, particularly if it's preceded by a vowel, forget about it. And, yeah. You know, in my opinion, we we say it normal. It's just a much more <laughs> casual way. If I say if I say car, I mean, I literally have to reform what my mouth is doing, and it almost yeah. hurts my throat. It just yeah. it just flows out naturally. So, I mean, is it is it a shortcut? Is it kind of a, a laziness talking that way? <laughs> it's probably a fair <laughs> a fair way to say it. All yeah. Right. Because uh, one there was a I think it was a Louis Louis C K bit where he talks about he he thought like an, until he was way older than he should have been thought vagina was actually vagina uh-huh. uh, because of learning it in, uh, in sex ed the whole bit's fucking hilarious but uh, at any rate uh, I'm gonna take a, a quick break I, I do want to let you guys know um, the way that you can support the show is to support our sponsors uh, I know some people don't like to hear ads but uh, that's how I do what I do for a living so. Uh, any support you can show for our gracious sponsors is much appreciated. And again, it does uh, does support the show. So thank you. What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. I'm sure uh, Bostonian will come back up. I'm fascinated by the culture there. But uh, what's the last book that you read and actually finished? The last book I read and actually finished. I just <laughs> finished uh, Million Dollar Consultant by, uh, um, uh, what's his name? I can't think of it. Alex Weiss. Would you say most of the stuff you read? Alan is- Weiss, excuse me. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is, is most of the stuff you read entrepreneurial, business-based, or do you mix it up? Most of what I read is uh, psychology, like personal development, and like training, fitness, nutrition type stuff, yeah. and, then, and then occasionally I'll sprinkle in Harry Potter, maybe some yeah, maybe some fiction, just yeah. to kind of change it. What, up. What's the best, or, or I guess what's the most recent like pure enjoyment fiction book you read? I read um, most recently was uh, Fight Club. Really? Actually, yeah. Like the movie Fight Club. The, the movie, book yeah, book. by oh. Charles Palahniuk. And oh, if you're not cool. familiar with him as an author. Uh, he comes up with some wild concepts. Yeah. Oh shit! Yeah, my wife turned me on to him. Oh, that's cool. Uh, what is your morning routine on a on a normal day when you're just at home and and there's not a bunch of crazy shit going on? Yeah, normal for us can can certainly vary with our work schedules and stuff. Sometimes we you know we're working late. Sometimes it's early morning. I'd say like a normal day. Uh, I stop pretty early. I'm a, I'm a I'm a morning guy, so I'm usually up around anywhere from like four to four thirty. And then I get into my morning calisthenics and physical routine, a little cardio, maybe some yoga, get the blood flowing. And I'll usually dedicate, you know, anywhere from five to 10 minutes for some journaling. You know, just kind of get some thoughts out, helps me formulate like where I'm going in that day, what happened yesterday. Um, And then start getting my, my meals prepped to actually hit the road and then, you know, go into the shower routine and then, yeah. From there off to the gym to do my resistance training. Yeah. No uh, nuts in your throat, cold plunge? No cold plunge yet, although maybe six weeks ago or so, I started incorporating a cold shower. Yeah. Yeah, so. To, to me, like, it almost seems semantics to go the full, like, I need to be submerged in 48 degrees. Like, as cold as the water goes, still fucking sucks. Yeah. You know, like, first thing in the morning, it still takes your breath away and, and still will make you cold for the next fucking hour afterwards. I, I would think that unless you're, like, a professional athlete, which, I mean, kind of you really are, but, I mean, for most normal people that aren't going and slaying fucking dragons every day or, you know, trying to compete in the Olympics, I, I would think that a shower would be sufficient. I don't know. Yeah, the science is quite interesting, man. Um, Wim Hof is a guy I got, I got yeah. into following, uh, particularly when I was training up to go to dive school and I was working on my breath holds and, and that kind of stuff. So I got hooked on him at that point. And he's a big proponent for the, the cold water and the cold plunge type stuff. So I, I incorporated it because it, it didn't chew up any really additional bandwidth in my day. So yeah. like my last two up to you know three minutes in the shower was just ice cold. Yeah. But I will say, I, I mean, I don't know causation or correlation, but... You know, about a month after I started doing that, so just a few weeks ago, my whole house went down with strep throat. Really? Which is super contagious. So my sure. wife and both my kids got it. You didn't get it. And I didn't get it. Yeah. So, you know, the whole cold therapy, it, it, 
it claims it has effect on your immune system and what that can do for inflammation yeah. and whatnot. So, hey, maybe that was... Now you're throwing them in the thing. shower in, or, uh, <laughs> involuntarily. Right. Yeah, uh, that's good stuff. All right, so you're from Boston. What, uh, what part did you grow up in? So I moved every 12 months as a kid, really, all the way up until I was in college. Uh, I was in a new location every year. So a lot of that was in the city, but then it was also North Shore... South Shore, so I'm like a more of a nomad. What, what was the reason for bouncing around so much? A lot of that had to do with my folks and what they were doing for work, and you know, grinding away. My father, in particular, was he was really you know he struggled with doing whatever he needed to do to put food on the table for two kids, and also trying to figure out what his purpose and passion in life is. Um, so he was he was chasing that. My mother was also kind of doing the same thing. Uh, you know, we struggled financially, so there was a lot of difficult, like abrupt moves for those types of reasons. Uh, and, you know, it, at the time, it was certainly really hot being the new kid in school every year, you know, yeah. like being bullied and picked on and beat on and beat up. Like back then, it really wasn't looked at as that big of a deal. Like today, like bullying is yeah. like a huge thing. Uh, so it was tough, man. But, you know, I can look back retrospectively and, and just be so grateful for that because it, that was where I began to be conditioned in terms of resilience and toughness and yeah. like dealing with those adversities from a young age. Were you a uh, late bloomer size? Like, were you a big kid in high school? No, no? tiny. I was a yeah. real late bloomer. Yeah. I was an enormous baby. I was born, I was like 12 pounds, nine ounces, yeah. like set the record at the hospital. <laughs> and then at some point I just stopped growing. Yeah. Uh, actually Ty Law, who is a cornerback yeah. for the New England Patriots, yeah. he was a, my idol. He was a small guy, but he's fast and he could hit like a train. Yeah. So uh, football was a huge part of my life. He was who I looked up to because he was so small. I mean, I, I wrestled at 123 my freshman oh, sure. year. It really wasn't until between my junior or my sophomore and junior year high school and then junior to senior year, I hit these two like massive growth spurts and I put on like over a foot. Wow. In the course of like a year and a half. Yeah. And that was all like gangly and awkward <laughs> and, you know, lanky. Yeah. But I had the height now and I just needed to, now I had something to kind of grow into. Yeah. Man. Uh, speaking of your, your parents growing up, was there a particular industry that either were involved in or, or was it odd job jumping around a lot kind of stuff? Yeah. So my father bounced around quite a bit, you know, different like warehouse jobs, uh, like FedEx type stuff. And then he eventually got into the nightclub industry and he stayed there for you know, maybe like 10, 12 years, uh, running a couple of them. And then he owned part of one of them. Uh, so he, and that was really where his passion was. It just took a while to get there. And then he took a massive gamble, basically dumped most of our savings into opening up a new spot in Boston. It's actually right down the street from the Boston Garden. And, uh, and it burnt down oh, shit. before he had fire insurance in place so he lost like everything Damn. and then it was like back to the you know back to the grind yeah was there any any particular spot that you lived in when you were bouncing around that uh, stands out as being exceptionally memorable or the most memorable for any reason one of the years uh, we actually moved in with my grandparents they live uh they still live in the same house it's in weymouth mass which is just south of boston uh, i lived there i think I, I lived there a couple times but one year in particular I was in, I think it was second grade that I lived there. And uh, just being around my, my grandparents who are just, uh, you know, amazing um, humans from Sicily and just being influenced by them along with my parents is something that I still remember today. Yeah. Um, are they still still with us? They are. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, good relationship with your parents still? Very much so. Yeah. My father had me really young. He had me at like 20, so we're really not that fine age. Yeah. So he's been my, my, my boy, my best friend for also yeah. for a really long time. That's awesome. At, at what point could you uh, take a shot at the title on, on the old man? <laughs> he would certainly tell you, you know, <laughs> hey, I don't care how big you get, yeah, I can I'll always kick your ass. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think he would probably still – he would still do well. Yeah. I don't know how much damage I could cause on my old man, yeah. really, regardless. So yeah. he'd probably take it. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting how that works, man. I'm kind of the same way with uh, my, my dad is, is bigger than I am. Um, and, uh, like, to this day, every time we see each other, it starts with a handshake. 
and then it it fucking gets like more and more violent and then we pull in because he was a wrestler mm. uh, from iowa you know and uh so it just it always turns into you know trying to fucking throw each other around in the kitchen or, or driveway or you know wherever it's uh it's a pretty classic shit but it's like the scene in uh in predator with arnold yeah they do the yeah. you son What's of a bitch you know? yeah <laughs> so you will break first yeah i mean it 100 percent does uh sans guns that size though neither of us are quite that jacked but um all right so you wrestled a little bit uh were there any other sports that you played growing up yeah football was was really my go-to i started that when i was i think six um, but then I played uh, lacrosse, basketball, I wrestled, I ran track. That was all through high school. <clears throat> lacrosse isn't something you, you typically uh, synonymize with uh, New England so much. Is it big there? It actually is pretty big up north. It's yeah. big because it's big in the Ivy League schools. Yeah. I had never heard of it growing up as a kid, literally. I mean, it wasn't until I got to high school, I was playing freshman ball, and the lacrosse coach came out towards the end of the season and was like, "Who who's interested in playing lacrosse? And I'm like, I'm not even, I don't know what that is. <laughs> and he's like, here's the deal. I'm going to give you a six-foot titanium rod, yeah. and you're going to run around a field, and you're going to beat the hell out of somebody with it. And yeah. I'm like, well, I definitely <laughs> want to do that. So, I mean, that's really all that all it took to close on me, yeah. man. <laughs> that's fucking great. Was there a, a particular sport, I, I mean, I guess it sounds like football, but uh, that you excelled the most at? Yeah, it was football. football. Yeah. What did you play? In high school, I was a strong safety. Yeah. But then, you know, again, because of my, my height that drastically changed, I started getting recruited around my junior year and then definitely in my senior year to play ball at, at college. And uh, the, all the college scouts were all like, well, like, what do we do with this dude? Because you yeah. grew like a foot since the last time I saw you. Yeah. So when I went to, when I went to UMass Lowell, uh, which is a D2 program, they switched me to outside linebacker. Oh, okay. Um, so from... From when you graduated, uh, was going to college and playing football, was that your primary focus or was that a backup to something? Or Yeah, that was the only reason why I went to college, yeah. man. I mean, I looked at the Marine Corps, actually, my sophomore year of high school. Mm-hmm. I was a horrible academic. You know, I hated school. I was a poor student. So athletics was the only thing that I really had that I had any interest in in life. Uh, but again, I mean, I, I, I yearned for – respect and strength growing up getting beat up as a kid like i struggled socially and the marine corps became this like potential outlet for me so i had kind of a game plan the only thing that stopped that from happening was me getting recruited to play football so it was the only reason why i went to college did you uh go all four years i ended up going for more like six and a half years (laughs) so you're a doctor (laughs) yeah in some places they call us doctors other places it's just me you're a retread what uh, what did you go uh, academically for? Like, what did you start out doing? I started out as a business management, I think, major. And I kind of just threw a dot in the wall. And I was like, whatever. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter to me. And my freshman year, we had to take like, pre-calculus or calculus one or whatever. And I was like in the class for 10 minutes. And I'm like, yeah, this ain't happening. I don't know what's yeah. going on. So I walked into my advisor's office. I'm like, get me out of calculus. And he's like, cool, these are your, <laughs> these are your options. that don't require calculus. Yeah. And he was also the head of the criminal uh, criminology department in the school. So I was like, okay, I'll do that. Yeah. So criminal justice. Or, yep. Yeah. Um, so throughout that process, were you playing football the entire time? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I played four years. Wow. Um, any aspirations or even possibility to go beyond uh, college ball, whether, you know, combine or, you know, trying to walk on or any, anything like that? Aspirations for sure. Um, but for one, because I was such a late bloomer in life, physically, uh, I was treading upstream. I also didn't have the work ethic at that time necessary to take things to the next level. But really, regardless, you know, my sophomore year of college was 9-11. And at that point, I struggled to stay in school because I wanted, I knew where things were going and I was really pissed off. Yeah. So even though I stayed in school, I, I continued to play football, enlisting, Assuming that this conflict or conflicts were, were still going on, yeah, that became my ne- my next goal. Yeah, so I mean, is it safe to say then that the the light switch moment for uh, military service was nine eleven? One hundred percent. Yeah, I mean that would be uh, tricky. I mean, if you if that happened your sophomore year, you, I mean you stuck it out another four four and a half years. Yeah, um, graduated. Mm-hmm. Did you enlist immediately after? I was in the recruiter station probably within a couple of weeks yeah. of graduation. Was uh, the officer route considered, or uh, I mean, now that you, you know you had a degree, so was 
the OCS thing just you didn't want to fucking deal with it or yeah I, I really didn't know much about the military I don't come from a super robust military family so I just walked in the recruiter station and it was like I know I want to be in special operations uh what what are my options and actually my first office I went into was the Navy I was really? like I want to be a SEAL you know and you think of like the greatest badasses operators on the planet the seals come to mind pretty fast so i'm like it's hard to argue that which hey understandably (laughs) so phenomenal marketing campaign you guys got movies so i'm like i'm gonna do this and it wasn't until i you know i went i went navy marine corps army in that order there were three offices in the same building from those branches and i got the same answers from the navy and the marine corps which was you got to enlist and then you can request to go the army has the 18 x-ray program give us off the off the guys off the street the chance to just go straight into the pipeline but that isn't an option for offices i got you so i was like okay cool and then i'm opening enlisted guy yeah uh were, were there thoughts or aspirations of at some point becoming an officer because you're a warrant officer now right yeah uh was was going the traditional uh officer route in the in the works or was it something you thought yeah maybe i'll do this for a little while and then mustang it over and, and become mm-hmm. an officer was that something you even thought about or didn't give a fuck no i mean i never considered it because you have to spend time in the conventional army yeah and at that point you know i'd been in sf for uh, quite a while yeah i was like i'm not i'm not about to yeah. go go do, go do that yeah uh, so from your perspective of you know growing up and not knowing much about the military and just saying hey i want to do special operations expectations versus reality as you're going through boot camp airborne selection all that stuff walk us through kind of uh how, how you uh navigated that yeah i mean expectations came you know from books and movies i'm going to get screamed at a lot and be doing a whole lot of running and walking in boxes all that proved to be true but uh, physically and even mentally it really wasn't all that difficult going through basic training i was i mean i was 24 years old i turned 25 in basic so I was a grown, I was a grown ass man, a lot of life experience. I'm surrounded by like 17, 18 year old kids, a lot of which yeah. are like losing their minds because it's the first time they'd ever left home. Yeah. So I became like the platoon leader from the drills like on day one. Yeah. So the great, the greatest challenges for me in those earlier phases of of indoctrination and training was just kind of playing the game, and you Dealing know being leaders. surrounded by kids that yeah. I was like I I just I need to get to like the real game here. Yeah. Like, let's get to brag and like really go to work. Once you got there, did you see a, an enormous shift as far as um, the, the physical challenge, the mental challenge, and, and how was that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I got to brag and then I went I went straight into uh, Special Operations Preparatory Course, SOPC, which is a program specifically for 18 x-rays, just to give them a little bit of kind of military training, um, land nav, like knot tying, like stuff that a lot of service sold, like soldiers already had learned. Yeah. So it, it's like a prep course prior to going to selection. And now I'm surrounded by other 18 x-rays, guys that have decided they want to be, you know, Green Berets. And then the cadre was really the, the biggest difference. Like yeah. These guys were like gods to us. Yeah. It was like, not only am I going to do whatever you tell me to do because you're telling me to do it, but going from like drill sergeants to like GBs was a big like mindset switch. I was like, okay, now I'm playing the game for real. Yeah. Was there anything that uh, caught you off guard or really surprised you about uh, once you got into the, the soft arena that you weren't uh, expecting? Yeah, for, for the most part, um, even in selection, which, you know, for us, selection is, is, a, is different in this way compared to like Hell Week is the cadre are like robots. There's one portion where they're like screaming at you and that's put yeah. there on purpose. But the rest of the time, it's just like, this is your direction. This is your task. Execute. And they're just like cyborgs. Yeah. I was anticipating a lot more like screaming and yelling and like, you know, cocksucker and like, get the fuck up. Like, you little bitch, like that type of stuff. But yeah. there's really none of that. Yeah. That it's, it almost like freaks you out. Yeah. It's like, what is happening right now? You're like emotionless. Yeah. You're like, what's wrong with you? Yeah, yeah, fucking Terminator Two up and up in there. Uh, you know, there's a weird mix of of both in SEAL training. Um, you know, there, like there's a time and a place to to really dig into people and, and get in their ass. But I would say most of it is is that same way. It's very calculated and yeah. and, and agreed. Like having been an inst- a student and an instructor, I think for that matter, even being a, a father, um, 
way more information is retained when you're talking the way we're talking right now than like as soon as you start screaming it's just fucking blank stares and in one ear out the other you know so there are facets of training that i think are are intensified by screaming and and swearing and and degrading and things like that but um i I think you know it's one thing that i i will say i think seal training really gets right uh, as far as a, a kind of a healthy mix of being that way when it makes sense and and not being that way when it makes sense yeah um, where did you go? Uh, I guess first, did you have any hiccups, any, any roles or failures, or did you make it straight through and, and go right into, a, an ODA unit or, or what was your path like as far as that goes? Yeah. I mean, I, I went straight through at that time, the way that the Q course was set up, there was a lot of, there was a lot of dead space, a lot of white space in between phases of training, which just prolonged the entire process. And actually it was a lot of times during those breaks, when you were waiting to go back down to Camp McCall to go into your next phase, that's where at, at those points where a lot of guys are getting dropped from the course because yeah. they're you know, going into Fayetteville or getting into fights or like DUIs <laughs> or you yeah. know whatever. Um, so it, I, although I went straight through, it still took you know the Q course alone for me it was like eighteen, nineteen months. Wow, like that, yeah. yeah. Um, was it all you, all it was cracked up to be from your perspective? Like when you finished, you're like, yeah, it's. I felt like I, I got full benefit. When I graduated, I felt like I was, you know, the green beret that I had put on my head. I was like, I know a lot of new things. I I got a lot of new skills. I'm like ready to go employ them on a detachment. And then very quickly you realize once you get to the team that the Q course is designed to give you like a basic foundation of like what it is we do here. And I showed up and within like 10 minutes, I'm like, oh shit, I don't really know anything. I got (laughs) like, I got a lot to like actually figure out now. Yeah. Uh, when you, how are you received showing up? I know, you know, like, again, just basing it off of my experience in the SEAL teams, like usually if there's a dude that's like, you know, as, as big as you are, like there's sometimes some guys kind of size you up and be like, we're going to fucking show this dude or, or whatever. Like he's not going to come in here and slap his dick on the table and, and, and show us or tell us anything. Like mm-hmm. we're, we're going to have to spend extra time. Was there any of that? There actually was not any of that, but it's a funny story. Cause I ended up going to, uh, we'll just say a specialized ODA as my first team, one that is almost always comprised of much more senior guys that do like the more standardized ODA stuff, and then they'll go over and do this for a little bit. So it was a much more senior team, an older team, guys that had been around for a while, but there were a couple that had all these plans of how they were going to like haze me in and like this stuff that is pretty typical for us. They didn't know that, <clears throat> you know, a six-foot – five 260 pound like jujitsu MMA fighter was going to like walk in the door, <laughs> you know? So I did, and I didn't know any of this for like months later yeah. when we we're in Afghanistan and they were eventually telling me cause nothing, nothing like that happened, yeah. you know, but the other guys in the team that were kind of past that a little bit in their careers, they'd already been doing this for like 10 years. Yeah. They were just giving those other guys shit like, Oh, Hey, what, like, aren't you going to make this guy do this? <laughs> like, go ahead, Chris, like have fun with that. <laughs> So you mentioned uh, jiu-jitsu MMA fighting. You you trained in, in those arenas prior to that? Yeah, so I started uh, boxing when I was real young, and then you know I, then I got into martial arts, which I did you know a couple different types throughout, and then uh, and then I got into jiu-jitsu. Was that before you ever came? I mean, like how how many years did you train in I guess jiu-jitsu in particular before you came into uh, the Q course time frame? Jiu-jitsu specifically. Uh, didn't actually start until I graduated the Q course. Okay. So I, my background was more wrestling, kickboxing, and boxing. Yeah. And then actually one of the one of the Robin Sage cadre. So Robin Sage is the final yeah. exercise we do in the Q course. One of the cadre, um, his name's Alan Shabaro, who now actually has a spot in McKinney. Oh, okay. Texas. Yeah. He was a. Uh, he was one of the cadres. He was on a different field team, but he he came over to where we were and just like pulled me aside randomly. I didn't know who this guy was, and he's like, "Hey, man, you know, I heard you're into like wrestling and like MMA and combative stuff." I'm like, "Yeah." He's like, "Cool, you know, I I run a program at this place. Like, come check us out." Oh, sure. So I did, and that's where I got more into jujitsu, and then that yeah. became what I was mostly interested in. Yeah. Do you still uh, train a lot in that regard? Not recently. Uh, I, I I I just got over shoulder surgery. I tore my labrum. Nothing traumatic, just kind of wear and tear over time. So I haven't been on the mats in probably a year. And I'm, as much as I love it, I'm, I'm currently 
weighing the prioritization of yeah. of getting back on the mats, you know, injuries and like the setbacks it has. And there was a time when I loved it so much, I was willing to risk a lot more. Yeah. And now I'm like, do I still love it? Do I need to do it? Because there is a way yeah. to continue to train, but am I willing to take that risk? Yeah. No, I'm right there with you. I mean, I, uh, it's been uh, four and a half years ago now, I had a full, full tricep tear grappling. And, uh, and it took forever for it to fucking heal. I mean, I had to have surgery and, and it took, I mean, the better part of a year to just be able to use my left arm normally. Mm. And I, I was kind of faced with that same thing a couple of years ago of like, man, does it really make sense to fucking get back into it or not? And, and for me, what, what's been a good balance is just doing only privates, you know, with high level guys that understand mm. A, exactly what my goals are, B, they know exactly what my injuries are. And they also know priority wise, and there's a, a few different uh, guys that I work with, but um, is saying priority number one is to not get re-injured. Like that's more important than learning jujitsu. So mm -hmm. keep that in mind with, with all of this stuff, you yeah. know? And then the second thing is like, yeah, I, I want to be as proficient as possible. Um, but I also want it to be as realistic as possible. Like I'm not looking to compete. I don't give a fuck about belts. I'm, you know, there's, there's no competition. I have any desire in entering. I want it to be as realistic real world applicable as possible because that's all I give a fuck about, you know? And so that's been a really good shift from going from kind of the traditional group classes and, you know, rolling with fucking mm -hmm. nine different people, different sizes and ages and levels and, and whatever, and, and really kind of rolling the dice on getting hurt to where you're going with a guy who, who, you know, intimately knows exactly what you're, you're trying to go for and, and also what things to kind of stay away from. Uh, for me at least has been a, been a good mix, but smart. Um, all right, so once you show up, uh, you realize, you know, you're um, kind of in over your head or you don't know as much as you thought you did. <laughs> what, what was the first, uh, you know, year and change like until you actually deployed uh, like for you? Yeah, so I, I immediately uh, got to my team and then I got sent straight to language school again. Oh, no shit. You know, so we were required to have a language qualification coming out of the Q course. I learned Russian in the Q course, got wow. to my group, got to my team. And they're like, cool, go learn Dari because we're about to go into Afghanistan. Yeah. We need someone else that can at least somewhat speak it. Yeah. I would love to hear Russian with a Boston accent. <laughs> you still speak it well enough? To, no. no uh, I think minutes. I may have just said all I can say. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. Uh, that's fucking great. I love it. Uh, yeah, so straight, straight into some language training. I think it was like four months. Uh, got out of that. We did some PMT stuff with, the, with my new ODA. And then, and then I was in Afghanistan. Yeah. I want to take a second to talk about something near and dear to my heart, and that is a staunch supporter of this podcast, which is Bub's Naturals. Uh, the hat sitting in front of me uh, here on our coffee table here in the studio belonged to Glenn Doherty. His nickname was Bub. Uh, I did two platoons with him, and his childhood best friend uh, and another colleague of theirs, uh, Sean is the best friend, TJ is their colleague, uh, started Bub's Naturals, which is a collagen and MCT oil company uh, in Bub's or Glenn's honor. And, um, you know, for me, it's, it's uh, an absolute honor to be sponsored by and working with a company that, um, you know, was started in the honor of one of my closest friends and, and a guy that I went to war with. And, uh, you know, the, the Bub's brand is not only super quality, um, you know, collagen, uh, collagen powder as well as MCT oil powder, um, you know, but they also give back to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation. Uh, they donate proceeds from their product sales to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation, which, uh, you know, to me just furthers, uh, you know, the, the mission set on Veterans Day. They give 100% back. So uh, I do believe it's the best collagen on the planet. Uh, I like to mix it in with uh, morning coffee. The MCT oil powder, the same thing. Uh, mixes in very easy. It tastes great. Uh, and it just kind of adds everything that you want to start your day off from a brain health standpoint from uh, joint support, gut support, um, you know, MCT oil and collagen are, are two components, especially as, as we age, uh, that are integral components to, uh, to health. And so, uh, to be able to work with Bub's Naturals and, uh, be able to, to work with them and, and sponsor a product that, uh, number one is a high quality product. And number two is, is so near and dear to, uh, you know, to my heart and to the mic drop podcast for, for who it, uh, was started for and what it stands for, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's an amazing, amazing place to be. So, um, it is whole 30 approved. Um, it's, uh, sport certified. So you're not uh, going to run into any problems with that. 
Um, and I will say that, um, you know, right now they're, they're offering, uh, 20%, <clears throat> 20% off if you go to bubsnaturals.com and, uh, use the mic drop code. So, uh, I really highly encourage you to, to try it out, incorporate it into your day, day to day for joint health, for brain health, uh, for cognition, for gut health, and, uh, and to support an amazing organization that does a lot of things, uh, in Glenn Bubbs honor. So, uh, go to bubsnaturals.com. Mic drop is the code twenty percent off. What was the uh, the first trip to Afghanistan like? Like day one, you're there. Was it overwhelming? Um, I, I don't know if it was overwhelming, but it was definitely a it was definitely a shock, and I didn't have much expectation as to what that would look like. What year was it? Twenty eleven. We went in, in January of twenty eleven. It was nine month nine month pump, and. Uh, you know, we get there, we flew into Canada High Field, and you know, our Advon team, a few of the guys were already on the ground, so we'd link up with them. We're on Camp Brown, which is the soft camp, one of them. And they're like, okay, cool, this is what we're doing. And I mean, my, my, my teammates just, they just told me what to do. We're like, go get ammo, it's over there, get that, load the trucks like this, with this, because we're gonna move out in like eight hours to go to our location, blah, 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 blah. So I was just like following their instructions. You know, but it was it was awesome to be in Afghanistan, even though I was on a fob. Yeah. Like, this is this is cool, and there's yeah. like buildings that are made of connexes and shit like that. You know, and I was like, oh, this is just kind of the way it is. Mm -hmm. And then you get to our site, which you know we were working split teams, so one they were both pretty wildly different. So that trip, I was exposed to a lot of what ODAs do man like i came in wanted to do like the gun trucks and the half infills and the kicking down doors like da which is why most of us want to come do this mm -hmm. and while we did some of that stuff we were also in almost and mostly doing more lower viz type stuff how, how uh were i mean for what you can kind of describe what all did that entail in terms of like indige fucking really blending in type stuff yeah, so this this is this is a good point. People are like, dude, you're like six six, like a white guy. Like you're not like you're not blending, <laughs> and then yeah. it's true. Like you're not. I'm not like going to walk down the streets of downtown Kandahar, and people are going to think I'm an Afghan. Like that's yeah. not what that is. Um, like low vis is really nothing more than you know maybe putting on like some man jams and like getting into a vehicle and like trying not to be seen by too many people, kind of yeah. thing. You're not. It's not this like covert stuff that you're yeah. doing where you're like painting my face to try to look like i'm an afghan mission impossible fucking active mask yeah man no what, what kind of stuff were you guys doing like meeting with sources that that kind of shit or but this was more um we have, we have preparation of the environment type mission um which is you know you can do that when you already have forces on the ground as well kind of by design that stuff's usually done like left of bang before you know like more traditional direct action elements would come in but um, yeah, a lot of a lot of analysis and terrain uh, assessments and like weak points, vulnerability points where like assets could move and come and go and yeah. who we could potentially work with for future whatever type stuff. Any uh, hairy moments or close calls during that stuff? Like almost getting rolled up or actually getting rolled up or anything? No, we never almost got rolled up or anything like that. Certainly some some interesting moments because I mean again. I, we were we were tasked with a series of missions to do, none of which were direct action focused. But you got a bunch of SF guys that all really want to do that kind of stuff. And depending on how you word what it is you're trying to do, it makes sense to hey, we're going to link up with you know two three eight Lurse and go on this like six day gaff con op that they're going on out to this area because we haven't been out there yet. We want to see what it looks like and talk to some village elders or like whatever, knowing that more than likely like we're going to get into some shit on the way. And like, perhaps that was the real reason why we wanted to go. Yeah. So you do that a handful of times and a lot of the chain of command, you know, it can get, you can work for six different entities. It's not just this linear path, especially when you get into the special operations world. And, uh, the, we actually, we fell under a seal, um, command structure for some of the stuff we were really supposed to be doing. And at one point he found out, some of the other ops we were going on, and he flew to our camp. Oh, and, no uh, shit. Yeah, it was a full bird colonel, and he's like, um, or lieutenant colonel, lieutenant commander, and he's like, hey, guys, uh, I know what you're doing, and, like, <laughs> knock that shit off, because I need you guys focused over here. Like, stop, like, going to find gunfights to get into. Yeah. yeah, that's classic. So that was a nine-month gig of doing mostly that. Yeah. Yeah. 
what was the turnaround coming home and then and going back? It was fast uh, for me. So I came back from that and we had some leadership swap out company, you know, commander and Sergeant major and I, our new guys came in and they were like, Hey dude, uh, you know, you did great in this mission, this last deployment, your team leadership wants you, but I'd like to get you onto a more like direct action focused ODA to give you that experience. And then maybe if you want to come back to this type of stuff, like down line, then that's on you, but I like yeah. these offer this to you. So I had that conversation with my team leadership and, they were like, yeah, no, we cool. It's cool. You can go. No, that's, I think it's the best interest for you to go do that. So I was going to make an ODA switch. Um, those guys, the team I was going to was just getting set. They were already out the door to go do um, a mission, like let's say like Northern CENTCOM doing some like non-combat deployment type stuff. But they were already prepped and ready to go. So there was kind of this gap in between. And then third group got uh, a tasking for a detail from a conglomerate of different organizations that were going back into Afghanistan. They were looking for an extra body, mostly for like PSD type stuff. And I was just fresh off of it. I knew the terrain, I moved around quite a bit on my first pump. So um, I was asked if I was interested in doing that, which I did. So I was only home for maybe like 90 days. Wow. And then I was back over there. It was a short, it was a short trip. I think it was maybe eight or nine weeks. Oh, okay. And then, uh, and then I was back. Then I linked up with my new ODA, and then we went into our train up. In that short eight or nine week uh, backfill or whatever you want to call it that you went over there, uh, any good shit happened then? It was pretty boring. Um, I was kind of like in awe and mostly confused as to who I was even working with. Yeah. I wasn't really told a whole lot. It was like, hey, this is your vehicle. You're going to drive this, and we're going to go from like A to B, and then you're going to sit outside, and we're going to go do some things and that you like don't need to know about. I was pretty confused. I was still totally green, yeah. you know, even just in the army. So I was just like, Roger that. Yes, sir. Yes, Sergeant. Roger that. So it was just a lot of that for, yeah. you know, several weeks. And then, uh, but it, it was, it was interesting to just from the periphery. And now, you know, like 15 years later, I can look back and be like, oh, well, I, I kind of get like what I was doing then yeah. or probably what these guys were doing in the time. I had like no clue what was going on. Yeah. So you come back uh, from that and then you link up with, uh, with who? My next ODA, my new ODA, which a DA focused team, I went straight into like individual training um, to learn more advanced individual skills. And that was more of a traditional train up. You do that and then you do collective training and then you go into your PMT and then back in Afghanistan. What was your uh, MOS throughout the whole whole shindig? 18 Bravo. Okay. We're the weapons guys. Yeah. Um, is that something that you wanted to do from the start or was it kind of uh – Hey, here's your options. And you're like, oh, that looks fucking cool. Yeah, I, I requested that uh, following selection, which is still the case today, you put in a request for your MOS and for your language. And they they give that to, it's like the top like 10% performers get what they ask for. And then the rest goes like, however it needs to happen. I requested to be a Bravo. I didn't know much of it. I don't have come from a weapons background. Like if at the time, if you live in Boston and you had a gun, you were either a cop or a criminal. Like, yeah. that was it. <laughs> so I didn't grow up around weapons. I didn't grow up hunting, like, nothing. But yeah. the Bravo section has the reputation for being, like, the ass kickers on the team. And I was yeah. like, cool, I, I want to do that. Yeah. Uh, so once you link up with him, um, you do all the train up. Now you're back in country with him. Is, is this now a different story and kind of what you signed up for? Oh, yeah. This was very much what I had kind of envisioned – Life on an ODA being yeah. was my third time back in on this team. You know, we were doing VSO, which stands for Village Stability Operations, a concept that, you know, looks really good on paper. It briefs well. It actually makes a lot of sense. But on the ground, it's 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 really difficult. Cause yeah. You're literally constrained with the infrastructure that you can build up. You know, the idea is that we're going to transition out of this, and we don't want to create something that's unsustainable for our partners yeah. and or something that could very easily be turned over to our adversaries and now we've just given them you know all yeah. this stuff yeah so what uh what, what was the operational tempo like from day one of setting foot on the ground was it super busy and you were just getting right into it and mixing it up or yeah what? yeah it, w it was incredibly busy i mean we knew we were getting dropped off into a into a hornet's nest and after being on the ground for maybe like three days at pretty much like 100% security, like patrol base style ops, because we didn't have much there. It was like a mountaintop and there was like some busted down HESCO and some chain link fence. There was like nothing there. 
after doing that, we did our first con op to literally, we just, we were going to drive down the road, maybe like 800 meters to a uh, Afghan local police checkpoint. And you could literally see it from like the roof of one of the structures we had. Like, cool, we're just going to drive down there and just see what these guys are doing. Part of our mission was to validate the ALP program, the Afghan local police program within our area, and then see what we can do to enable that to beef it up. So like, cool, Roger that. I was in the fourth truck, fourth truck convoy, and literally before the third vehicle left our motor pool to drive, you know, seven feet to get under the road, we were in an ambush. Wow. So like, they were like literally all over us just waiting for us to move to do stuff. And that was just confirmation that, yeah, this is going to be exactly the kind of trip we thought it was going to be. Yeah. What, uh, were you guys overwhelmed in that initial uh, ambush or did you uh, handle it fairly well? No, nah, that was that was relatively simple. It was really just like a handful of dudes, you know, getting creative, trying to get their jihad on with a couple AKs. It wasn't anything extravagant, but as we progressed, then um, you know, we found ourselves in much more difficult situations. Yeah. Can you say uh, the region you were in? Wardak. Wardak. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's pretty uh, synonymous with uh, being being a rough yeah. rough no go zone. Pretty much everybody that's been there has, has kind of a similar synopsis on it. Um, as you guys progressed through, got more and more comfortable, and, and I'm assuming a little more ballsy as it relates to pushing out further and, and kind of pushing the envelope more, was there, a, was, was there ever a shift where things seemed like, holy shit, what, like, what are we doing? Or, or was it calculated enough to the point where it was uh, obviously strategic to you guys as team members as to what you were doing and, and how you were doing it? Yeah, I mean, there were... There were several uh, occasions where we bit off more than we could chew and it became obvious. You know, the first time I was wounded, I took some grenade shrapnel to the back of my shoulder and, you know, we get ambushed from this village that we had never been in before, which ended up being one of their major strong points for the Taliban. And just a handful of us, you know, we, we dismounted and began fire maneuvering through into toward this compound within this village. And, Although we had fire, support by fire positions, our trucks were set up. I mean, we had some stuff in place, but we were like way over our head. Like yeah. we're doing like urban mount stuff with like four of five of us doing this, and like we're getting in like close con, combat, com, com, yeah, close combat scenarios. And me being wounded was like a a light bulb went off, particularly for like my team sergeant and team leadership. They were like, okay, well, like we need to reassess what we're doing here and be yeah. a little bit more. These aren't just all you know, a bunch of dirt farmers that are just trying to throw some pop shots off and then run. Like, these guys are fighters. Yeah. And, like, let's let's be a little bit more calculating. Uh, in terms of, like, SSE, you know, fo follow-up after some of the missions, were there any big surprises uh, that you guys encountered, whether it's foreign fighters, whether you know, the way they were dressed, the money they had, the you know, w w was there anything that stood out as, like, holy shit, like, these guys are connected to X? On that trip, not really. Nothing that I can recall like blowing my mind where it was like, wow, this is all like making sense and it's connected to this much bigger network. Uh, so they, they were, while they were fighters, it was still, they were more indigenous local fighters, yeah. not Chechens or Algerians or, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can you walk us through the, uh, or I guess first question is, is that the, the only time you were wounded on that trip? No, I was wounded on three times on this trip. On that same trip. Same trip, including, you know, losing my leg eventually, yeah. So the, the first one, uh, the shrapnel, can you uh, give us the, the quick down and dirty as to how that happened? Yeah, we, we get ambushed, uh, a couple second-story structures from the from the road, and then a bunch of uh, dudes lobbing some indirect and some RPG. It was pretty good. handful of us begin maneuvering uh, towards this. We clear all the way through to one of the structures. It was either PCAM or Dishka. It was really tough to tell because there was a lot going on around us, but there was also some kind of HME-like explosives that were being dropped off rooftops um, as we were moving, and we were getting ready to breach the courtyard to one of these to one of these compounds, and it could very well have been a blessing that this happened because, again, we were, we were way undermanned for what we were doing, and there, who knows what was on the other side of that door. We were getting ready to breach, and uh, yeah, something blows up behind me. I just feel the impact. It's like someone hit me with a bat, and I look back, and there's like a you know lemon-sized hole in the back of my shoulder. God damn. I was like, 
didn't really hurt, you know, like adrenaline's pumping. It was more just like the shock. I'm like, well, that totally just happened. All right. And then uh, one of my teammates came over to me and we kind of just strong pointed. He threw some gauze, threw a combat or a uh, pressure dressing on it. I was fine, really. And my team sergeant was with me on, on, the, on that element. And I'm like, hey, man, let's go. Like, let's, let's go back to work. And he, that's when he was like, uh, no, no, no. Like, we're, <laughs> we're done here, man. Yeah. And that was, I think, I'm grateful for that because yeah. that was like, the, uh, wait, what the fuck are we doing right now? Yeah. Let's reconsolidate and, like, rethink what we're doing. Yeah. Um, so you guys make it back. Um, I guess from, from your recollection, did you guys get some of their guys in that altercation or was it just kind of tit for tat? You took the, the shrapnel and you guys bagged ass and went home. Oh yeah. We, uh, I forget what our EK was during that engagement, but it was like three, four five. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so when you get back, what was the, the process like for you to get treated and then ultimately get cleared? Cause typically, you know, a wound of that magnitude in, in a lot of cases would have ended your deployment. Yeah. Was that, all you saying I'm not fucking leaving was like, how did that fucking happen? <laughs> it's a funny story. I mean, they had, hours later, once we got back to the house, you know, my medic took a look at it, team sergeant, and they were like, nah, let's get you medevac and get you in front of a doc. I threw a total like, an embarrassing temper tantrum. <laughs> Eventually do what I did and do what I was told to do. Helicopter shows up. I get on it. They fly us to one of the outposts that our company command element was out at, and they had a bunch of medical personnel. So I get in front of them. They're like, hey, the way we treat this is we, we pack it with this antiseptic gauze like four or five times a day so that it closes from the inside out. We don't we can't just sew it shut because then it leaves this open cavity yeah. that's prone to infection. So I'm like, okay, cool. This is like very basic, very simple. I was there for like two days and I'm like, this is what we do? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, well, I can do this myself. My teammates can do this. Like if this is all that is necessary, then I can go back to my, back, back to my guys. At that point, was it more painful? The, the packing pot sucked. Yeah. Yeah, that was painful. I'd be, like, biting on, like, a stick. Yeah. Because you know, that, that did suck. But, it, you know, it was, like, a minute or two, man, yeah. whatever. So I'm like, I'm ready. I can do this. We can do this. This is fine. Like, get, get me back out there. Well, for one, all of the rotary wing flights that were going into Jalrez, which is the district we were at in Wardak, were all generated out of Bagram. So I knew I needed to get to Bagram at some point. I'm, like, hitting up my company leadership. I'm like, well, let, let, me, let, me, let me get back. And they're like, hey, we talked to the doc, and his orders are, you will stay here until this thing is completely close because he doesn't want it to get infected and then it gets worse. Well, the doc was out of Bagram. And after another like three days of sitting there, uh, I got real impatient and then ended up getting real insubordinate because I grabbed one of my buddies <laughs> and said, hey, man, take me down to the tarmac. And he did. And I went from one C-130 to another and I eventually found one that was flying to Bagram. And I was like, hey, can I get on the flight? And they were like, sure. You know, whatever. So I just like had all my shit and just like got on a plane and just like took off. I didn't tell anybody. Oh, shit. And I tell my buddy, I'm like, give me a couple hours before like if you feel the need to report what we just did, like yeah. give me an hour or two. So I get to Bagram and I had never been to Bagram <clears throat> before. Really, we flew in, but we were in and out in two seconds. Camp Montron was the SF camp. So I landed Bagram Airfield. I really have no idea where I am. I make my way over to Montron and I walk into the op center and uh, our sort of commander, which is my battalion level leadership, he, uh, he sees me and he's like, hey, dude, like, what are you doing here? Well, he's from Brockton, Mass, right? Big Sox fan. Actually, he brought to Afghanistan a bleacher seat that he bought from Fenway Park when they were remodeling oh, the stadium. Sure. So we brought that over there and that was like his like battle captain chair. Yeah. That's so awesome. he's so excited to tell me about this chair that he's really not paying attention to the fact that I'm not where I'm supposed to be. So he's telling me about this chair. Look at this chair. Isn't this awesome? I'm like, yes, yeah, sir. This thing's amazing. You know, whatever. Well, then the, then the battalion CSM comes over and he's like, hey, dude, what are you doing here? And I'm like, oh, here we go. Now we're about to get into this. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I need to get a flight back out to Jarrez. And he's like, aren't you supposed to, weren't you supposed to stay over there until, you know, you were healed? And I'm like, ah. Eh. Maybe, I don't know. Well, then the phone rings. <laughs> <laughs> the phone rings. He answers it, and it's my company sergeant major who's calling from the place I had just left. And uh, losing his fucking mind. <laughs> yeah, the sort of CSM's like, oh, yeah, no, he's standing right in front of me. And I'm like, yep, this is definitely about me. <laughs> and I don't know, am I going to get, like, court-martialed? Like, what's going to happen? <laughs> I definitely disobeyed some orders. I know that that's not good. And he puts me on the phone, and my company sergeant major just unloads on me, you know, for, for 10 minutes. A lot of a lot of really nice phrases, things. yeah. 
at the end of which he's like, Hey dude, listen, like I totally get it. Um, I've been there, you know, don't ever fucking do that again, but your heart's in the right place. Just like be smarter next time. Yeah. I'm like, Roger that. So I quick got that fire's put out. I'm like, Hey, I need to, I need to get on a bird. And, uh, the dog comes in and I get into a somewhat unprofessional argument, debate, spirited debate with him about my ability, my team's ability to keep me uh, healthy. And in that moment, my team is out on an op and they get into a gunfight, they get into a tick. And this was the first time I had ever seen this from this vantage point. From the- From a jock. Yeah. You know, the screens are everywhere. It's like red lights going, essential personnel only, like people are scrambling up assets. And I'm like, this is- Tom Clancy novel shit. Yeah, man. I'd never seen it before. So I'm like, wow, this is what this looks like for you guys. (laughs) And I'm like, oh shit, that's two six. Those are my guys. And then my team sergeant takes a round to the abdomen. So now he's wounded. Medevac assets are getting spun up. I'm like losing my mind, man. And- uh I throw another pretty substantial temper tantrum, one that I'm not proud of, but at the end of which the the sort of commander looked at the, looked at the doc and was like, "Hey, dude, good luck keeping this guy from going back to his boys." So yeah. I, was, I was on a bird the next day, back <laughs> oh, out to the guys. Yeah. Did um, did the doctor come and talk to you at all, or was he just like fucking whatever? He was pretty pissed and just yeah. was basically like, okay, well, like, you know how to treat it. And like, if this thing gets infected, it's because of you. Yeah. I'm like, Roger that. Yeah. No, no problem. So I'm assuming, like, did he stockpile you with all the shit that you needed to, to fucking treat it? Or did you guys have all that stuff? I think I got some stuff from one of the medics that was there before I left. But it really wasn't anything more than, uh, than this, like, antiseptic gauze that our guys typically have anyway. Oh, okay. So no problems with the healing process of that? How long did it take to fully fucking heal? It took a bit of time, man. It took probably seven, eight weeks. Oh, shit. So, yeah, I mean, my frequency of having to pack it slowly winded down. It got to a point where it was just, you know, once a day. And I'd bandage it up. We'd go out on an op. Sometimes I'd bleed through the dressing, and, you know, we'd swap it out, and it just became a thing. Was it a a hindrance pain-wise at all during, like, did you not really notice it? No, nah, I didn't notice it at all. Really? Usually when my teammates would be like, hey, you're, you know, you're, we, gotta, we gotta swap out your dress. You're on your period, fuck wad. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's wild. Um, all right, so you go right back into it, or as soon as you hit the ground, uh, first of all, I guess, what happened to to one of your guys, The uh, was it the platoon leader you said that, that took around to the gut? So my team sergeant, team sergeant, yeah, so he ends up getting medevaced out, which is the only reason why I stayed uh, at Bagram because I wanted to be there for when he got there, which took like an extra, it was like 12 hours for him to make his way to Bagram to then get medevaced out. So he went to one spot, got treated, then got to Bagram. Um, I met him up there and then he was loaded up. He he flew to Germany and he got treated over there and then he came back in. Really? Yeah. He came back in same deployment, man. Mm -hmm. is a fucking getting it uh all right so you go back you get right back into it are you doing you know op tempo wise like every day going out not every day i'd say our average was probably four a week yeah something like that and uh hot and heavy pretty much every time pretty much yeah yeah pretty much if we were if we were driving if we were gaffing somewhere we would get ambushed somewhere nine times out of ten either on the way there or on the way back was it mostly a target of opportunity just taking pot shots or was it like was, was there some pretty calculated uh, ambushes that you ran into mostly i'd say target of opportunity the second we'd fire the trucks up you know the entire network would start going these guys are about to roll go somewhere a few of them would just get ready and go some other ones were much more deliberate you know ied initiated type stuff which is the, the type of event in ambush when i was wounded the second time that was very calculated can you walk us through that whole fucking thing start to finish yeah so November 27th, uh, 2012. So we infilled in September, shrapnel to the shoulder. That was like late September. And then, so just a couple months later, we were on the way back from a, like a KLE type mission. We went to go meet and talk to some like district leader of some sorts. And the, the road options are extremely limited. Sometimes there is only one way in and one way out because you're in the mountains of Wardak, yeah. you know? So if you're driving, you're, you're going to hit multiple points that you've already driven over, which is not great. And they know you're going back to where you came from, so they can set in on your way back. This yeah. is what happened on this day. And uh, for vehicle convoy, I was in the trail working out of a hatch. Uh, lead vehicle hit an ID. We had hit 
a bunch of small IEDs prior that none of which created all that much damage. What are you guys driving in? Matt V's, IG31s, and then side-by-side razors. Okay. Like little dune buggies, yeah. little mini dune buggies. I rolled one of those once and broke my collarbone and tore my... Uh, <laughs> that can happen. I said 10 and no fucking seatbelt like an idiot. Yeah, that so tends to ahead. happen. Yeah. All right, guys, I know, uh, as you can see, I have a beard. Uh, our good friends at Manscaped now offer the Beard Hedger Pro Kit. Uh, and I'm going to level with you. You can do the face beard or you can do the uh, the groin beard. You can still use this uh, in all the places you've been using it before. However, this is designed for the beard, and since I have one, they sent me this kit, and it's phenomenal. Uh, the guard system is great. Uh, it does not snag uh, the way a lot of other beard trimmers do and have. Uh, it's got a titanium blade that uh, you know is very sharp yet still uh, gentle enough to not uh, screw your face up and, and give you the nicks and cuts that, uh, that again, a lot of other products do. Um, this cordless trimmer, uh, it has one, this one guard does 20 different lengths. So if you want to, uh, you know, give yourself a face mullet and, uh, you know, business in the front and party down below, if you will, uh, you, you certainly can do that. There's a lot of adjustability with it. Um, I, I will say this titanium blade is kind of the uh, the varsity squad of this unit, if you will. It um, it's really really high quality, and you can tell when you're using it, um, both in in its action and just looking at it, feeling it. Uh, it's a very very high quality piece of gear, uh, and it keeps my beard looking the way that it does. What's awesome is they also have beard shampoo because uh, God knows you can get some stuff in the beard. You've got beard oil to give it uh, that lay down shine that uh, all the ladies love. You've got uh, beard conditioner, which again, if you're in the shower and you want to uh, fluff it up a little bit, that's your huckleberry. And uh, you got the beard balm, uh, which again, if you uh, don't like quite the oil uh, but want more of a balm, you've got that. There's a, a beard brush, kind of similar to almost like a curry comb, uh, and then also your wooden beard comb, which uh, I use the hell out of this thing. So uh, this complete kit is awesome. Um, it, it's new from them. They've uh, historically been uh, kind of the nether regions uh, manscaping products, uh, which, again, uh, I still use and are still phenomenal, and you can take the guard off uh, and still use it uh, for this. But uh, you can get 20% off and free shipping uh, with the code mic drop, all one word at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. That's mic drop. If you have a beard, order this. If you want to shave your pubes, order it also. And you can still use those products on your face or wherever you feel like using them. But Manscaped has been great. I use their product. I have for a number of years. Uh, they are my go-to uh, trimming piece of gear. So uh, go check them out. That's manscaped.com. Mic drop, all one word for 20% off and free shipping. Do it. So a lead vehicle hits a, what was estimated 350 or so plus pound IED. Just, I mean, literally picks this truck up and launches it off the side of the road. And I could, it happened directly in my line of sight because I'm working out of this hatch in truck four. And instantaneously, I'm like, everyone in that truck's dead. Like, period, all stop. There's no way anyone's surviving that type of explosion. And I actually could see my buddy, fellow 18 Bravo, his name's Nate, who was working out of the turret of that truck, like launching through the air, like a fucking lawn dot. And I'm like, okay, they're definitely all dead. So I uh, I don't do what I'm supposed to do. You know, we have mounted react to ID and mounted react to ambush SOPs that I I don't follow, Something not something I'm proud of. I end up jumping out of the hatch and off of the roof of the truck that I'm in while it's still moving and I just take off on a sprint towards the lead vehicle. Lead vehicle landed in this apple orchard off on this depression on the side of the road with a passenger door facing the sky. This is kind of a key point. I eventually make myself to that vehicle, not, not moving tactically whatsoever, just like rifle in hand, like dead sprint. And that was the initiation of a complex ambush, somewhere around like 15, 17 fighters. L-shaped ambush, PKM, some Dishka, some RPGs, like full-blown shit show, gunfight. And, and this wild card 6-7 Boston guy running fucking full tilt. Like an asshole, <laughs> right? Just like straight through it. Um, 
I get close to the truck. I trip. I slide off the road into this orchard. I trip and fall. I look back, and it was, I tripped over my teammate that I didn't even yeah. notice was there. The dude who got ejected, Nate, and I'm like in shock. One that I step right on top of him, but two, he's alive. You know, and he's clearly dealing with some initial blast injuries. Um, he bit through most of his tongue, so he's bleeding out of his mouth. His tibia is snapped completely in half, but he's alive. And I'm like, what the fuck? I'm like, all right, man. So I'm like doing like an initial sweep on him. And then I hear gunfire from behind me, like new sounding gunfire, just pinging off the side of the truck. I turn around, there's three shitheads just with AKs, just kind of slowly walking towards the truck, which is like 30 feet from me. Just like aim, kind of just like ting, 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 just shooting at this obvious target. So I'm like, all right, I got to go deal with this problem, which is a surprisingly difficult decision to make. I hadn't been put in that environment where it's like my friend is here, like scared and asking for my help. And I've got a threat that I have to address. So like to leave him was surprisingly a difficult decision. Obviously, I'm glad I, I did that. So I leave him, I go uh, towards these three dudes. I smoke the first two and then the third takes off running kind of at an angle away from me. Now this is an apple orchard, but it's in November. So there's not a lot of greenery. It's all, it's all just, bare. it's a very, a very bare <laughs> veg. And he's, he's got his rifle over his shoulder as he's running away, just like spraying in my general direction. And I'm like maneuvering through these, these trees trying to get a shot. And next thing you know, I'm looking up at the sky. And what I had thought had happened was I had like smacked into a branch and it just knocked me over. I didn't find out for hours later that this fucking idiot actually clipped me in the side of the face Jesus, with an AK round. <clears throat> so he's taken off, I'm on the ground, I get back up, I'm like looking around what just happened. Okay, I'm fine, Like, let's go finish off this dude. And then I can smell and hear the fire from the vehicle. So now the vehicle's on fire, Matt V's on fire, kind of towards the rear end. And I'm like, shit, I don't know who's, if anyone's inside this truck, so I, Another really hard choice because I really wanted to kill this fucking guy. So I let him go and now I go towards the truck and it's just kind of a pile of metal at this point. Uh, the only access point I could see was the passenger door, which again is facing the sky. And fortunately it had been blown off the hinges because those doors weigh like 800 fucking pounds, man. So I'm like, all right. So I climb up the truck. I look in and I detach my commander, our captain, is wedged in the front seat and he's actually on the radio trying to establish communications with Haya, which says quite a bit about that dude and his training and professionalism. I mean, he's in a decimated truck that's on fire. He's dealing with a ton of injuries. One of his legs was basically hanging on by a thread below his knee. He's got an arterial bleed coming out of his armpit. He's, uh, he's in really rough shape. And now I'm seeing and hearing rounds from inside the truck are now cooking off from yeah. the heat. So it's like I'm looking inside of a bag of popcorn. It's like pop, 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 pop. We're still receiving some like semi-accurate machine gun fire from the perimeter. But now our trucks are engaged. Our guys have got, you know, mortars up. So they're kind of going truck on truck, machine gun on machine gun. And we're kind of in the middle of all this. And I'm on the roof of this vehicle, at least on the top of it. And I'm like looking around, man. I'm like, Yeah, there's no way either of us are getting out of this one. But uh, I also know I will not be able to live with myself if I just move move on. So I'm like, okay. So I jump in through that opening, grab him, kind of start shimmying him upwards. And he's a big cat. He played offensive line at West Point. I mean, this dude's like 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, like 290. Yeah, it's like the biggest fucking ODA team in the history of fucking the Army. Or there what? was a lot of jokes that the <laughs> that SF was trying to build an ODA football team because yeah. my whole team, we were all pretty big. But we did used to joke about myself and the captain, us as a team, that we could never ride in the same vehicle because we were the only ones big enough to move the other one. So, yeah. like, you got to keep you guys apart. And we were this was us just kind of talking shit. Yeah. Turns out it, Turns out it actually – yeah, it actually happened. Uh, so I managed to get him out and I, you know, I just chuck him off the side. And so at this point, some of my teammates and partner force guys had showed up. They pull him out. We end up rallying up all the rest of the dudes that were in that vehicle. There were six total, all of which were alive. Uh, wow. Established a CCP, get them going, start getting HLZ locations set up. You know, at this point, the 
RJ Tack, our controller, had, had, he was calling in fire. So like eight, 10 gun runs are coming in. Spectre was on station. They're dropping like 105. So the fight only lasted another maybe like 20, 30 minutes beyond that point. And then, um, and then all roads proceeded to getting these guys treated and med- medevaced out. During that, um, from the time that you took the, the round of the face until you got your captain out, uh, and and kind of during that whole thing, what was the rest of the team doing, and what were the uh, assaulters on the uh, enemy side doing at that point? Do you know? Aside from those three uh, dismounts that came up to the vehicle, I don't I don't think the the guys we were duking it out with were really moving around much. I mean, they had a pretty good L shape going on our lateral and on our front, and. We, we didn't really get a chance to maneuver on any of those positions because we were returning fire much more statically. Some of our guys took some high ground. <clears throat> One of our snipers started engaging from some of the um, the high ground behind us, but mostly it was machine our machine guns, our mortars. We had a small sniper section that just dis- that moved up, and when they were they were taking some dudes out that way. But the guys the guys that weren't returning fire with more, our more heavier weapon systems, we're also then maneuvering the vehicles for Kazavak, which is what they're really supposed to be doing. Yeah. Was the, the return fire on your your team's end sufficient to to suppress the, the ambush enough for you guys to move relatively yeah. freely? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Because uh, I was like, you know, thinking of it like, damn, are you guys just getting lit up the whole fucking time trying to move around there? Or? No, no. They, they really weren't able to advance <laughs> on us. That's why, like, there was semi-accurate fires on my position but most of the enemy fire was on our trucks and most of their trucks was on them yeah and i mean we had su- fire superiority pretty fast yeah but we just weren't in a tactical position <clears throat> to be able to maneuver on them to end the fight sooner yeah because we, we also had a truck and casualties and yeah. the terrain dictated our movement yeah do you know um close air support wise did uh did the attacking force get completely neutralized I think the the BDE on the back of the end, end of that was like ten or twelve EKIA, um, and maybe like two or three squirted, maybe yeah. four or five that yeah. got out. Yeah. Well, most of them got yeah got what they came for. Yep. that's fucking awesome. Do you know mm-hmm. if the the guy that got you did he ended up getting? I, I I never know. I, I never know. knew. No. Wow. Did, yeah. Did, I mean, did any of the team after the fact ever say that they saw a guy running or? Yeah. So my teammates did. Yeah. But you know he wasn't a prioritized threat to them because they're dealing with dudes actually shooting at them. Yeah. But yeah, some of the guys that were kind of behind me um, along that line and at those positions, they, they did see the dude yeah. taken off. Wow. What was the uh, sum total of your injuries from getting hit in the face on that? So it clipped an artery. I obviously got really lucky, um, but it did clip an artery and it looked a lot worse than it was. I was losing a, I was losing a f- substantial amount of blood but I didn't, I didn't know what had happened. So we get a CCP together, casualty collection point, and we're treating the six dudes. And one of our support guys, one of our attachments was in that vehicle. And he's in the back seat, and his right eye had come out of his face from his injuries. And so I'm treating him, and John. I'm, so I'm putting John's eye back into his eye socket, and I'm like roping it off with gauze. And one of my teammates comes up from behind me and he slaps like some gauze against my face. So I'm working on John and then I'm looking up at him like, I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? And he's like, dude, you're like pissing blood out of your face. And I'm like, what? And I'm like, oh yeah, I ran into it. Like I ran into a branch. Like it's not a big deal. And I'm like, you're clearly overreacting right now. Like I have work to do. Like get your, get off my face. You're like caressing my face. And actually I didn't realize this until like years later, um, cause we had a bunch of like GoPro helmet cam stuff that some of the guys were wearing. And in that exact moment, our senior medic is next to me and he, you can see him, he looks at me and then he looks at one of my teammates and he's like, he like points at it and he's like doing this, but I'm, yeah. you know, I'm working, so I'm yeah. not paying attention. So, oh shit. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, obviously it did, it wasn't bothering you if you didn't even know it was a deal. No. Uh, the six guys that were in that vehicle, did all of them make it? They did. Wow. Yep. Uh, your captain, I'm assuming, was medically outed after oh, that? Oh, yeah. Well, he stayed in, actually, for a little bit of time. Um, he, he's a blow the knee amputee now. Uh, he went over to SWIC. He actually pinned 04 Major, and he was the company commander for the company that houses selection. Oh, no shit. So he, oh. he did medically retire now, like, I don't know, four or five years ago. Yeah. He stayed in for another 
you know, three, four, five, three, wow. four years. Yeah, that's amazing. You can keep in touch with him? Yeah, every now yeah. and then. Yeah. Hey, man, you're good. I'm good. Cool. Yeah. yeah. See you, bro. Um, was the was he the most injured of the six or was the guy that uh, that you initially encountered and, and started to treat was he worse off no captain was the worst was the worst did yeah. any of the other guys get me- medically retired all of them all um of them. well except for the one that i tripped on he's still in now no shit he's a team sergeant in third group wow mm-hmm. so the one that you were like he's for sure dead that was blown away the fuck out of the thing it, yep he was fine Not yeah fine but wow yeah. he's still in now Amazing. Um, did the did that wound two things? One was your wound um, from the the initial shra- shrapnel wound earlier. Was that still wounded at that point? Yeah, a little bit. Um, did the did the face wound af- affect or impact your ability to do anything, or, or was it? I mean, I don't want to use the word superficial, but in terms of its impact on your ability to operate, did it hinder that at all? Not at all. Yeah. No, I mean, I did get medevaced um, hours later. Yeah. Because of the amount of blood that was coming out, my medic was like, "Dude, like I don't know, I, I could I can sew you sh- show sew you shut, but if you've got an artery that's in there that's clipped, like I'm concerned about that. So let's yeah. get you out." So eventually, I did. Where um, exactly on your face was it? It's on my right. Oh, okay. You can barely see it. Yeah. Um, and the cool story is, is uh, there was actually a the the army reservist doctor that worked on me when I got to Bagram for this in his civilian life owns a plastic surgery clinic really yeah so he just oh, happened so he to be was, on yeah. his army reserve let's go play army for six months thing yeah. but he's a really a plastic surgeon and hooked you right up yeah so i meet this dude <laughs> and uh yeah I, I had no idea he was a plastic surgeon until actually after the procedure but it was really short and quick he's like hey man i'm gonna cauterize the artery shut i'm gonna take this little medical welder put it in there melt it close it and then sew you up and like you're gonna be fine wow that was it dude that's amazing um how how did your team adjust losing that that many guys? Like, how did you guys kind of shift? Did you pull guys from other other groups to now backfill, or or did you just run with six less dudes, five less dudes? I mean, what? Yeah. So out of that truck, um, two were SF guys. Okay, guys on the team, my captain and our Bravo. Okay, the guy that got so both of them were medically back. They were done okay. for that deployment. So the other four, the rest were a couple infantry guys, um, and then one of our. Terps, one okay. of our interpreters was in there. I got you. So this was November 27th of 12. Well, at that point, that's kind of the end of the fighting season, especially in Wardak with the mountains, because yeah. the snow comes in at like the very beginning of December, which is why that they did this kind of Hail Mary attack at yeah. the very end of that time. The last hoorah kind of thing. So the timing was, I won't say ironic, because it was probably planned that way. We were all going into hibernation mode for probably the next six, eight weeks. Us and our enemies, like no one can move. Yeah. You're talking like feet of snow just drop. Like no one's moving. No birds are coming in unless it's an extreme emergency. Everyone just kind of hibernates. So um, we really just needed a new detachment commando, although we had our warrant on the team as well. So he becomes the detachment commando, which is part <clears> of what the warrant officer does on the ODA. So immediately our warrant, Brian, takes over command and maybe two weeks later they sent us a new captain who was who was brand new to group and he was working in an ops position out of Bagram to backfill and take over as our team leader wow um any growing pains with that shift or did you guys move pretty seamless into going out and kicking kicking the shit out of people with him transitioning in yeah so I mean again we had like two ended up being about two months of time for him to get integrated okay with us um, so the so you guys stayed through the winter and then fought after that yes okay yeah. I, I guess just mentally i was i was assuming that uh that the last uh, operation with uh you know with the the big i don't know do you call it an accident it's not an accident i don't know incident what, incident yeah. uh, I, I just assumed that that was before before that so okay so you got a two-month period during that that hibernation process i'm curious uh living conditions wise um and also what the fuck were you guys eating mm. uh during that time we were getting resupplied purely via airdrop because they couldn't land any birds near us or they wouldn't risk understandably so so it was a lot of mres yeah um and then like kicker pallets that would come out and we wouldn't know what <clears throat> what we would get sometimes yeah. it would be awesome stuff we did have a cook that was out there with us who uh managed to build this awesome little kitchen that was 
built from nothing. You know, he like built a grill and he like built a little like oven top plate to use. And this guy was a Navy submarine cook. Oh shit. Yeah. You want to talk about some weird people. I've only <laughs> met two in my life and they were both complete yeah. weirdos. Yeah. This dude's I, name I is, think you have to be, I mean, you know, I think you have to be yeah. somewhat out of your mind to want to go do that. Yeah. His name was Z, uh, a cook. So he, you know, yeah, they drop, they drop stuff for us out of the sky. You know, little parachutes open up, they float down. We go retrieve them. Is there a weirdest thing that that, uh, that they dropped food wise or just supply wise? You're like, the fuck is this? <laughs> One of the weirdest that certainly had the greatest effect on us was an entire kicker pallet full of uh, pies. The really? whole thing was pies, <laughs> and I'm sure like our our uh, our supply guys would, like were hooking us up, you yeah. know, because we're living the, our first six weeks, eight weeks, we lived off like nothing. Yeah, like we're like buying goats off of locals and just killing them and boiling them up and. There was some, a couple, you know, cases of MREs we were eating, but we really didn't have much. And the, one of the first airdrops we got with food, <laughs> one of the pallets was full completely of pies. And we had been eating nothing but like the same three things every day. So we opened this thing up and it's all pies. And dudes are grabbing pies and just <laughs> eating them like sandwiches, right? Uh, and then everyone just gets sick because yeah. it's like way too much sugar, yeah. way too much shit, like all yeah. at once. It was pretty funny. Yeah, that's fucking classic. I'm assuming no no showers, no running water, nothing like that. No, right? there was a well uh, <clears throat> directly in the middle of our camp, which is why they chose that as a location. So at least we had some water yeah. to go off of. But Were you treating yeah. it before you Before it? we would consume it, we would, yeah. yeah. But for like hygiene purposes, we had that. Yeah. And we kind of built, our Charlie's built this like, this shower contraption where you could fill it up and you could, you know, whatever, would kind of make it work. Yeah. But no, like, traditional showers, no toilets, yeah. you know, so wag bags. Yeah. Right? Like, you know, yeah. For those that don't know, it's a bag that you shit in. Yeah. You burn it, burn pit, you know, which was, like, way too close to where we were living. So I'm quite certain at some point I'll yeah. probably start seeing something yeah. pertaining to that. Yeah. Some toxic exposure bullshit. Yeah. Um, as far as the actual living uh, encampment, I mean, was it plywood fucking bunks and shit like that or cots or? Mostly cots. Um, I mean, you guys freezing your asses off? Yeah, yeah, it yeah. got cold. Uh, one of our drops, we got a bunch of like space heaters, like little small ones. Um, and eventually, we ended up getting a couple more like generators, smaller generators that we could use for like little heaters. But it got pretty, it got pretty cold uh, going into December and January when the temperatures dropped and like twelve feet of snow would just like show up out of nowhere. Our, our poor Echoes, man, the Echoes are the Camo guys. Man, these guys would have to go up onto the roof for this like real sketchy setup we had where our op send was to like get all the, you know, satin tennis and shit back up like yeah. every 20 minutes when the snow would come down. Yeah. I'm like, dude, can I help you please? They're like, no, like, don't even look at me. Don't talk yeah. to me. I know how to fix it. Just like shut the fuck up and get away from me. I'm like, all right, man. Yeah. I love you. Oh, that's classic. <laughs> uh, did you guys have uh, anything heavier than small arms? Did you have artillery at all there? We had a uh, eighty-one millimeter mortar. Oh, okay. that was the that was the heaviest piece we had. Yeah. Uh, any like Gustav or eighty four oh, yeah. millimeter? Yeah. Yep, Gustav for sure. Are you guys using that much? Oh yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Any uh, any specific instances of a Gustav fucking coming in handy? <sighs> yeah, I'll uh, I'll share this story. Um, I'm not sure if I've ever shared this live or to like an audience before, but we got ambushed. You know, again, normal. I grabbed the goose. Another two stories clay structure and. It takes me maybe three or four rounds to get um, on target. And, you know, you can set Gustav rounds to proximity detonation. Yeah. So based off of the range, you know, you can set it to 200 meters, 400 meters, whatever, and it'll just automatically go once it hits that distance. So I finally dial it in, and I put, um, you know, like three, four rounds, like straight through this window into this second-story structure, and they're going off on the inside. And that totally ended at least that <laughs> threat, you know. Yeah. And it wasn't for like hours later, we end up maneuvering over to where we were taking that fire from to do some BDE and uh, and we walk up, I walk up, we clear through, I get up to that second story building and it's just like pink mist and a lot of goo and limbs. And Is that like, where that new Jocko flavor comes from? Pink mist? Yeah, it might be. Maybe. Yeah. Shit, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> Which is actually my favorite flavor yeah, of Jocko Co. That's fucking good. Uh, to me, it's a, it's a tie between that and uh, the Sour Apple Sniper, but yeah. that's another story. Fucking yeah, so... Pink mist everywhere, huh? Yeah, so clearly uh, a lot of multiple uh, people were up there, 
and one of which uh, was a, a, a small person, like a child. Oh, no shit. Yeah, so I see the shoe of what was probably like a six-year-old. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I need to step outside and get like get myself composed. So I did that. And you know, my team Saji came over, team team leader came actually my team, yeah, my team Saji came over and you know, he's like, Hey man, you good? I'm like, Yeah, I'm good, you know, and he's just like they put that person there. Like they put that person there on, on purpose. Yeah. Like you there's no way you could have known. you you know, you did you doing what you need to do, you did everything right. Uh and which I knew it helped to hear that in that moment, but you know, now I'm a, my oldest is five, and it's just like, at the time I didn't have kids, but I could still, yeah, it still, it still impacted me, man. So, you know, I know a lot of guys, I'll just say this, this in general, guys struggle with some of the decisions that were made, you know, in combat. And combat's a nasty fucking world, man. It can get ugly, and you got to do, um, you got to do a lot of things that goes against us as maybe as humans, but that's what we sign up to do. Yeah. Were there any other decisions made or actions that you took that uh, really tested your resolve or that you struggled with similar to that? Yeah. I and mean, we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk more about, you know, the events that resulted in me losing my leg, but you know, the decision that I made in that moment in time is one that again goes against our SOPs and what, what we are trained to do to react in their ambush, which is what this was. And I deliberately decided to do something different based off of a love of a teammate and expose myself as an additional risk to try to prevent another loss of life rather than doing my job. And although I look back, you know, knowing that my decision was make was made out of love and, and, and integrity and with morals, uh, it's still one that's like, well, what if I had done what I was supposed to do? Yeah, could could have things played out differently. <clears throat> you know, it's it's an interesting mentality and and question I think for for war fighters. You know, they're and I I apologize to uh, always link things back to dog training, but there you know there are just there are a lot of parallels with dog training in life. Um, you know the there's a term, you know, selfish love that, you know, sometimes it's hard to rationalize exactly what you're talking about of what seems like it's the right thing to do, but it's based on emotion, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's where I think it's the trickiest, whether it's any aspect of life or going to war or whatever, is that when you, when you're basing decisions that, that ultimately wind up being actions that are based off of emotion and not logic, most times they're the wrong decision. Yeah. Uh, bef bef I guess before we get into that, would you say that that was the case? I know you can what if it to death, but like if, if protocol wise you were supposed to do X and you did Y instead, mm -hmm. I, I know it's, imp you know, it's easy to uh, armchair quarterback, but I mean, looking back on it, do you think you should have gone X instead of Y? I should have done what I'm trained to do. Yeah. which is move to cover and eliminate the threat. Yeah. Um, that said, if I could go back in time and, you know, Marty McFly shows up in the DeLorean <laughs> and he's like, hey, man, let's 1.27 gigawatts and you can yeah. go and do, and do the right thing. Uh, would you would you do that? My answer would be no. Still, uh, So I have no regrets with what I did, even though yeah. I know that it goes against what we're trained to do. Yeah. So speaking of, uh, of morning routine and really throughout the day, you know, health and fitness and overall well-being is something that uh, I focus on as I get older. I get more and more kind of in tune with what works and what doesn't. Um, <clears throat> and I recently started working with uh, Ketone IQ, which is HVMN.com. Uh, um, this product is, uh, is a really, really good way to start the day, uh, as well as basically just any time you need uh, a boost from an energy standpoint. Uh, you're getting ready to do something physically demanding, mentally demanding. Uh, you know, before I record, I take a shot. First thing in the morning I do before workouts uh, to recover after workouts. Um, you know, I, I take it multiple times a day. Um, and it's, I mean, there's no sugar, it's vegan, there's no caffeine, there's no salt, gluten, 
no artificial flavors or sweeteners, uh, and it, it works from a, a ketogenic standpoint, uh, giving your brain and body the fuel uh, that it needs to do tasking um, uh, tasks. So, you know, it, it, it's a phenomenal product, uh, an amazing company. That's HVMN.com, and the code is MICDROP, all one word, all caps, for 20% off. Uh, I can't recommend this product enough for... Um, again, getting going in the morning, uh, pre-workout, post-workout, uh, you're tired in the afternoon. Uh, it's a, a super healthy way to feed your brain and your body from that uh, kind of glycogen replenishment standpoint that, uh, that tends to crash a lot of people when they're using caffeine products or carb products, et cetera. So uh, I love this stuff. Uh, I use it uh, several times throughout the day, uh, and I encourage you guys to, to check it out as well. It's uh, hvmn.com. And that code is mic drop for 20% off, all caps, all one word. Uh, so I guess before we get into that in particular, or that uh, operation in particular, was there were there any other operations of note between um, the Gustav rounds going into uh, the two-story uh, building and when the leg incident happened that are of note? And did you guys have dogs with you ever? Yeah, oh yeah, we had a dog. That whole time? Mm-hmm. It wasn't a soft NPC. We had a we had a conventional um, MWD explosive dog. Detection. Yeah, he was he useful. was explosive and bite, um, incredibly useful. Any good stories with? Uh, <laughs> yeah, him one laying the ivory in particular. Yeah, so his name is Bach, and uh, his handler's name Mo. Conventional army guy. Mo is about like I don't know four and a half feet tall. Bach was a massive German Shepherd. So just the two of them paired up in itself was pretty the awesome. Same size, right? Mo's like this. He's Cambodian, maybe, or Thai, like little dude, this little savage, and he's handling Bach, who's like, you know, he's like a 120-pound German. And we used him a bunch. He actually, he was wounded twice um, during that trip. And there was one event in particular where we came in, breached the compound, and, and Moe's got, Mo got Bach, and the compound had a dog in it, like one of these, like, Afghan mountain dogs. These things are just massive yeah. <clears throat> and it's it's it comes out of nowhere and boom and now do, now Bach and this dog are going at it and Mo is like on the line and he's trying to get his M4 up to like take a shot at this dog but he's like getting all spun around and uh, I had already been into this other section of the courtyard and I hear the, like the chaos and I come back out and I see this like craziness <laughs> and I'm like oh man I'm, I'm like trying to like maneuver to like get a shot eventually like Mo grabs Bach jerks him back the dog's exposed boom I can take a couple rounds and put the dog down um and the, the weird thing about it is I was that was the first and I think it's the only time I've ever had to kill a dog and I like really didn't like having to do that yeah you know I really yeah. didn't like it no I, I mean I can imagine because it's I guess for me in, in hearing that I mean I wasn't there and and another one of those kind of big picture scenarios things it's like picking the lesser of two evils but um you know if you put yourself in like that dog shoes or that what it, whether, whether it was a family or you know wherever the dog came from it's like the dog just doing his job right it's yeah. like there's a fucking there's some there's another animal in his house that isn't supposed to be there and he's just doing what he's supposed to do and gets fucking killed for it you know yeah. that sucks it sucked you know but uh it sucked yeah i mean i i, I can imagine that i would fucking struggle hard with that but um because i love dogs man yeah i love dogs you know we've you had any? dogs my whole life yeah we have two ridgebacks yeah um, those are real common uh do you live in fayetteville now no i live in just outside of clocksville i'm okay. stationed at fort campbell oh i got you there seems to be a Ridgebacks. It seems to be a popular breed with Army SF guys. It is. We had them when we were at Bragg. So I was okay. in third group prior, and yeah. that's when my wife and I um, had Ridgebacks to begin with. Yeah. Um, but so anyway, so on that, I guess on that mission, uh, Bach gets uh, separated from the dog. Were there any uh, follow-on um, skill sets or, or, I guess, mission successes that that dog had with uh, – apprehending people or finding you know hme explosives yep. or anything yep he found explosives for us a whole bunch of times uh he found narcotics for us a bunch of times he was probably mostly used when it came to tq tactical questioning yeah because these guys like scare the shit out of people you could put a gun to their head <laughs> and they're like whatever but you bring that dog over and he just starts going and they'll tell you what yeah. they'll tell you whatever it is you want to know <laughs> they are petrified of these things yeah uh, any uh, legit apprehensions where he went and fucked somebody up? He took down a few squirters. 
um, on some of on some of them that I can remember. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but he so he was not an MPC. He was a regular army. Uh, Bach was a regular army guy. And, yep. Er, okay. Um, all right. So <clears throat> I guess the the first part of that question outside of the dog aspect. <clears throat> Were there any other operations that stood out in your mind as being super memorable or worth sharing before we get into the into the wounded one? <clears throat> um, no, nothing's coming to mind. They're all they're all kind of blended together, kind of the yeah. same type of stuff. Yeah. Um, so the morning of um, the uh, the incident that that we'll get into, can you? Uh, Walk us through that kind of uh, soup to nuts, and and was there anything different that stood out that morning that you woke up? Like, was there any weird fucking premonition or any, anything where it just like it felt different or something like spidey sense or any kind of sixth sense kind of thing? No, nah, man, just a just Normal another day. day. Yeah, another day. Uh, and we only had we only had a couple weeks left, maybe two three weeks left in the rotation. So we've been there for like five and a half months. So, you know, still business to do, and we we're getting ready to go on to one of the larger operations. So we were, we were partnered up with an Afghan commando unit, an Afghan special forces unit. And they're, they're built the exact same way that we are. Same MOSs, same everything. They lived with us on our compound. That was our primary partnered unit. And that's who we did most of our stuff with. But if we, had, we were going on a bigger operation or if we needed more personnel for some reason or if we were being politely asked to bring some of these conventional units with us, we would. And the first time we did that, you know, so our, our compound was set up with interior ring and exterior. The interior is where we lived, it's where our ops end was. The exterior is just where our motor pool was and some storage. The first time we did a partnered op with the conventional army and the conventional national police office or police force, these guys were just like bombing into our compound, like trucks and dudes. There was like, you know, like a hundred of them. And we're like, whoa, this is a horrible situation. Like we need to get a hold of this immediately. So we developed an SOP that when these guys would show up, they would the entire unit would stay outside of our compound and just the leadership would come in. So then we would brief them on what we were doing and then we would go do it just to minimize how many people were around us with guns. It's a vulnerable position when you're all lumped together like that. And that worked fine for the whole trip. On this day, it's March 11th, 2013, uh, leaders, leadership comes in to our motor pool and also a Ford Ranger pickup truck comes in as well. And I notice it immediately. Most of the guys notice it immediately. Certainly the Bravo section, me being included, like we build our base defense plan. That's part of our job. So the second I, this thing comes in, I'm like, yep, that's a violation of our SOP. It's a violation of our protocol. And I'm at a decision point where I either can address this now walk up to him and be like, what the fuck are you doing? Get your shit out of here. You know the rules and you're breaking it. Or I can wait and take kind of the more diplomatic approach where I talk to my team leadership. He talks to their team leadership and like it gets figured out that way. Which would be new for you. A lot of ways. <laughs> yeah. In a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, and ironically, that's the, that's the route I went. And, you know, this is another game, a cyclical game of what if. You know, did complacency set in? Is it because I only had two weeks left in country? Was my mind really in the game? You know, I don't know. Um, I do know that I made a de deliberate choice in that moment. I was like, okay, I'll talk to my captain once we get done with today's work, and, like, this will get addressed. It's also not uncommon for Afghans to do, like, weird shit. Yeah. You know, it's like, it happens all the time. So, like, complacency can also be part of being conditioned to seeing the wrong thing happen a million times, but nothing bad happens because of that. This just becomes a really interesting and sometimes evil psychological game you can play with yourself or others. But I decided then I was like, okay, I'll deal with this later. Let's just get through today's work. And uh, we, you know, the team gets into our circle to do our final combo check. And my, I was one of the first ones in the in order. We went like Alpha Bravo. So my captain is next to me. He's like, you know, Alpha One. Everyone can hear it. Yep, thumbs up. It goes to me. You know, Bravo. Yep, cool. Up. So as soon as I'm up, like I turn and start walking towards my truck, which was behind me. Even though really, you're kind of all supposed to stay there to make sure that this is done correctly. Insubordination again. Not proud of it again. But I start walking towards my vehicle, and that was when I hear the rounds start cracking off from behind me. And my first thought, 
again, was one of our Afghan partners just like accidentally cracked off his AK, which, you know, kind of happens. And it's like round two, round three, round four. I'm like, okay, this is being done on purpose. And it's definitely coming from a belt fed machine gun, you know, and all this is happening like really fast, but adrenaline jacks, time slows way down, turn my head around. And sure enough, one of these dudes, an Afghan national police officer jumped up on the back of that Ford Ranger which had a mounted PKM and just was ripping into our group from like 15, 20 feet away. So an ideal target of opportunity, like the most vulnerable that we would ever be at any point of the operation was right there and then. And this guy capitalized, which was the initiation of a complex ambush. So he opened up and then we started receiving fires and rockets and shit from around our compound. So I see what's happening. I see this guy, you know, Dudes are dropping, dudes are scrambling. I know what I'm supposed to do, move to a piece of cover and smoke this dude. But I see one of our infantrymen who was set to come out for us as a driver that day, frozen, like deer in headlights. 18 year old kid, first deployment. I think he'd only come out with us a, you know, a few times prior and he's just standing there staring at this guy 25 20 feet in front of him just like a ghost and i'm like okay uh i'm gonna go towards him instead so he's not more than seven eight feet in front of me i take some aggressive steps towards him you know i get to him we go chest to chest and i kind of rotate my back towards the gunner and that was when i was hit for the first time the top of my right leg and that weapon at that range is like you get yeah, hit by a freight train you know, it's really not like a piercing sensation. It's like you getting hit by a truck. So it knocks me down on top of this soldier. So we're both on the ground, chest to chest. I'm on top of him. And then I feel a couple more impacts to my legs. And I'm like, okay. And this is a 7.62 by 54. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So I know I'm hit, um, which I had experienced that in the past. So I was kind of conditioned to it to a degree, like, adrenaline and kind of physiologically what happens when you're going through that kind of extreme trauma. So I'm, I'm, I know I'm wounded, but I really can't deal with that right now. There's a rifle laying next to me. One of my teammates had dropped. So I grabbed that and I roll over. I put that in action. I take some horribly placed shots at this shooter. I don't even come close. Um, and then eventually one of my teammates comes around the corner from the side of one of these trucks and he smokes this dude. So then the initial threat's been dealt with, and now we're in a gunfight all around our perimeter. So the rest of the guys, the rest of our infantry guys, they're all sprinting towards, you know, the towers we built and different fighting positions, and they're returning fire on that. I'm in no position to address anything going on out there, so I move to my next task, and that's to check the status of the soldier, which I do, and headed to a sweep, no bleeding. He's got an airway. He can talk. I'm like, okay, he's in relatively good condition. He's in shock, but... Other than that, he's fine. So he hadn't been hit at all? No. Oh, wow. No, no holes. Um, nothing other than being in shock. So now I need to see what I'm dealing with. So I you know, roll myself over and I rip my pant leg open. And my right leg, dude, is just, it looked like it got, like a shock had gotten a hold of it. It's just ripped to shreds. There's just exposed bone, tissue. And there's just a river of blood flowing from me to where I had initially been hit. And I'm like, okay, my femoral artery has definitely been clipped. I might have eight minutes to live. So we need to stop moving here pretty fast. So I get a tourniquet off my kit. I strap that on, boom, I lock that in. Bleeding doesn't even slow down a little bit. I'm like, yeah, I'm definitely dying here. How, how high up was the highest injury on your leg uh, at that time? It was maybe three inches below my hip, like okay. below my pelvis. So way the fuck up there. Pretty high, yeah. yeah. First so tourniquet it, goes on, yeah, and there's... So you're putting the tourniquet way the fuck up by your hip. Then. Oh, yeah. Okay. Very, very top yeah. of my leg. And uh, seeing the tourniquet <laughs> do nothing just confirmed what I had really known, what I, what I believed to be true from the second I realized that my femoral was cut, that I'm definitely dying now. Like, there's no question about that happening. But let's, uh, let's just see what we can, you know, what we can do about it. 
So first tourniquet goes on, boom, I throw a second tourniquet on, lock that in, doesn't really do much. I'm like, okay, well, you know, let's just keep adding tourniquets. Did you have any quick clot or anything or any of those like hemostatic dressings to pack pack in to, to clot it? I did, which eventually I did use. Yeah. Um, my first course was just tourniquet, tourniquet, tourniquet. I put two on, my teammate got, got to me and he put the third one on. He gets IV access for some follow on blood or meds or whatever. And I'm like fighting him off of me because I'm like, I'm, I'm in the expecting category, dude. Like if you're doing triage, I know it's a mass cal situation. You're wasting time and resources on a lost cause. Do you know how many other people were hit? I didn't know at the time. Yeah. Um, it ended up, there were 12 of us wow. that were wounded or killed. Three were killed, nine others, Americans wounded. And then another like seven or eight Afghans that were killed or wounded. Do you know how many uh, enemy fighters were engaged in this entire thing? Yeah, it was like 17 to 25. Yeah. Um, so this was their, this was their like Hail Mary. Fucking this is the Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah, man. We had been kicking their ass for, you know, five and a half months. And these guys are all smart. They know why we're like, what our rotation schedule looks like. Most of these guys know, you know, we typically do six month pumps. So they, this was their chance to like push us out. Yeah. Right. Make us make a, make a stand and make a statement. Um, so my teammate puts on a third tourniquet, IV access. Okay, cool. And then, you know, his work was done. So we said our goodbyes and he moved on. He had a lot of, he had a lot of shit he needed to do. So I'm laying there and I'm like, uh, I'm pretty sure I'm still bleeding out. I go to try to lift my leg up to see if I could see blood trickling out the bottom, but my femur had been completely shattered into like 15 pieces. So it was not moving it under its own power was not an option. So I grab it with my hands and I lift it up. And this was the first time the pain like really kicked in now that I'm like lifting it and it just like surges through my body and I'm on the verge of blacking out and I'm like, Oh shit. Just like just hang in there, dude. Hold on. Like focus. Don't go unconscious. I managed to lift it up and I could see blood still seeping out the bottom. And I'm like, yeah, uh, I may only have another like couple minutes here. What else can I do? So I grabbed some of this combat gauze, all right? And it's got kind of like a sticky, like tacky yeah. aspect to it, when, particularly when it gets damp. <clears throat> I loosen up the, the top tourniquet and I just create a power ball with this gauze, which is just nothing more than rolling it into a ball to give it some, you know, density. And I just ram that into my thigh and I'm trying to feel, I'm like feeling kind of up towards my pelvis and I'm trying to feel for the pulse of the femoral. And this is something that, you know, you do in training, but like most things, it's completely different when you do it in real life. And it's even more different when you're doing it on yourself. Yeah. One, just like the sheer shock of you like doing what you're doing, but then also from a medical perspective, when you're losing that much blood, your blood begins to shunt inwards to protect your organs for as long as possible. So you have like no blood flow going through your fingers or your toes, like everything moves inward. Your dexterity is fucking terrible. It's gone. Yeah. I'm dealing with these like meat mittens. <laughs> you know, it's just like I got nothing. Sounds like a porn term <laughs> while we're at it. Hey, hey, bring me those meat mittens real quick. So I can't I can't really feel much, but you know, at some point, I'm like, yeah, I think I feel something, you know, what, whatever, the hell with it. I just ram down. I feed the rest of the gauze in, secure the tourniquet back on top of that, and then, uh, and then I go unconscious. Oh, shit. Yeah. From, from what you remember during, from the initial when you were hit until you go unconscious, ballpark how many minutes? A handful of minutes, or was it? Ten? Ten. During Eight, that ten? Ten, yeah. During that window of time, was, was there a hornet's nest of activity gunfire wise oh, yeah. that entire so the whole time is just fucking pure chaos pure chaos yeah yeah do you know from the time you went unconscious until um i mean it, do you know how long that entire fucking engagement went on i do um well certainly i know that information now in the moment i didn't know exactly but by the time i was eventually getting loaded onto a bird I did know that a good amount of time had gone by because just because of where the sun was. So you came came to bef like before you. Oh yeah. You didn't, you didn't wake up at fucking land stool or Walter no. Reed or anything. Like. No, I actually I came to maybe like a minute later. Oh no shit. Yeah, and then I you know I drug myself over to where some of my teammates were at. Um, I knew my work on my leg was done. Like I had nothing else to throw at this thing. So I'm like, okay, this is where this is going to end. So let's just 
do whatever you can between now and that instant. So I drove myself over. I was actually talking to my senior medic, um, a dude who had just worked on me like so many times and, and a lot of other, other, other guys on the team. He took a round through his calf and someone had already put a tourniquet on him and, but it's painful, man. Like tourniquets yeah. save lives, but they are painful. Yeah, especially three of them, I would imagine. I've never had one on, but yeah, it sucks. It's, it's totally painful, but my, my boy is in pain because he'd been shot, but also because he got a tourniquet on. And I just was like trying to talk to him, man. Like this is going to, how I'm going to spend the rest of my time yeah. here. And then I was really in and out of consciousness for the next hour and a half. Cause that's how long it took before the first bird could touch down. Wow. Um, did anybody do anything to you in that hour and a half to further, um, triage your your situation or, or was what you did all you had had until the bird showed up other than guys coming over to recheck on my tourniquets they really didn't have much else to do i mean did somebody give you fluids at least i believe at one point i had fluids put on i don't remember yeah wow if and when that happened anything else that you remember between then and when you got loaded into the uh medevac I remember having a quick conversation with our controller, our combat controller. Um, he really ended the fight. He, they sent us every platform that they had in, in country. Uh, he decimated that whole valley. So I remember at one point looking up at him, and uh, I was just like, "Delorean, I'm like get the you know get those motherfuckers right." His name is Delorean. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, Delorean. So it's two Back to the Future references. <laughs> yeah, ironically, yeah. <laughs> Uh, man, that's fucking wild. Uh, so what happened next? Like when, when was the next time you remember anything? I remember getting loaded on the bird. Uh, one of my teammates grabs me by the face and looks me in the, looks me in the eye, tells me he loves me. And dude, like I had written myself off like the second I knew this, the, what happened, right? I'm like, I'm definitely dead. I didn't know how much time I'd gone by, but I knew it had been a lot. And when he said that to me, my response was like, how am I even still here right now? I should definitely already be dead. And it gave me this next, it gave me this surge of energy that I'm like, maybe this isn't it. Maybe I can win this. Maybe I can battle through this. And him saying that to me just put me into this combat mode that I was in now. And although I couldn't see an, an enemy and I wasn't firing an M4, like I was very much in a fight and I was about to start to throw some fucking punches. Yeah. So medevac out and me and my, my, my two teammates that were most critically wounded. And from that location, they had two options. One was that location where our company was headquarters was at, which had a forward surgical team that was closer to us. The second option was to fly us to Bagram, which has a full scale medical hospital. So it was basically speed versus level of care. Which one do we want to do? And they went with speed, which is probably the right call. Because yeah. me in particular, I needed blood, like bad. Mm -hmm. So we get to Shank, Bob Shank, and uh, they pull us off, you know, right into treatment. Uh, we both, me and my teammate both go on transfusions immediately. And I don't know how much time went by, but eventually my entire body begins to just completely shut down like liver, kidneys, lungs, everything's deteriorating. And they assume it's just based off of the trauma or the infection or the the, the obvious wounds that I've been dealing with now for almost two hours. I would imagine shock probably plays shock. the biggest role, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, shock will kill you. Yeah. It's, it's nothing to, it's not just like, sometimes people think shock, like you're surprised, like, yeah. oh, like shock will actually kill humans. Yeah, physical, physical shock. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> or physiological shock, I guess. But <clears throat> So everything's crashing, man, and uh, they don't know what exactly is wrong, but they know I need to get to Bagram. So they put me back on a helicopter, and they fly me to Bagram, which is like an 11-minute flight. And it's while I'm airborne that they go to change out the bag of blood that they were giving my teammate, and they realize that they were giving him O positive, even though he's AB negative. Holy shit. And they were like, wait a minute. And then they go look to see what they had given me, and they had given me AB negative. So and they switched up on names, and I'm O positive. So they switched up the bags, switched up the names. Fortunately for my teammate, Owen, he can have O positive. He can take O positive. Yeah. I cannot take AB negative. God. So that's what crashed everything. Dude, that's crazy. And this is all while I'm airborne. 
So they call Bagram and they're like, hey, man, we just pumped Nick full. It was like six units Damn. of an incompatible blood type. There's no way he survives this flight to you. Just be prepared to receive his body when he gets there. And in a lot of ways, they were kind of right. I mean, I totally coded uh, the the flight crew, the dust off crew were getting real creative with shit to throw at me. I mean, and they were they were told in route what they get. They were given an update, and they're like, "Well, we can't like, we don't have like the exact stuff to deal with this, but we do have like this, this, and this." And these guys like dumped out the med bag on me. I mean, it was panels. They were injecting like shots of like adrenaline, like direct adrenaline into me. And like, they just did all kinds of stuff. Cause they were like, why the hell not? Like what's to yeah. lose? Like this dude should have been dead an hour and a half ago. Let's just like see what we can do. And they kept me clinging on enough to get me to Bagram. I get off the bird. I'm innovated. Like a machine's breathing for me. I have like barely a pulse dialysis, another transfusion. Um, and it was just real touch and go for like three days and then slowly my you know my pulse began to come back and then i slowly just you know came back do you remember much of those three days no like basically basically none of it i have one memory and it's 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 kind of a horrible memory uh so my now wife she's also active duty oh wow. she was in bagram deployed at that time so she had a front row seat to all this stuff at that time we were really just like close friends um I have a memory, my, I think it's, I'd say it's my only one from, from that period of time, is she's bedside of, to me. And when you're intubated, you got a machine that's breathing for you. When you come to and you try to breathe on your own, you can counteract what the machine's doing. So it feels like you're suffocating. It's a horrible, horrible experience. And they had restrained me to the bed because I kept ripping this tube out of my throat. So I'm restrained to a bed, tubes are all down my throat, and I would, I would come to, apparently that happened repeatedly, and then one of the nurses or something would see me and they would just poof, like put me back down. But I have one memory of coming to, tube in mouth, Tony, my now wife, is next to me, and I'm looking over at her, and I'm trying to like mouth to her, kill me. Jesus. Right? Obviously, I can't actually say anything, and I can't even move my mouth because it's just like propped open because I've got tubes in it. But in my head, what I was trying to say to her is kill me um, because I'm in this like vegetated. I didn't know exactly what I was dealing with, but I knew I couldn't move any part of my body, and I had this like thing rammed into my lungs. Did she have any concept of what where you were at mentally at that point? No. Have you talked to her about that? Oh, yeah. 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 So is, does that, how's that impacted her uh, t telling her that, that that was going on? She understands yeah. what, because in my mind, I'm like, I'm a vegetable, Yeah, you know, and like her and I have had these conversations, like th at this point you pull the plug. Yeah. If this happens to me or if this happens to you, like I'm your next of kin, I'm your, I'm the decision maker on this kind of thing. Her and I are both very much in line with that. So she, she gets it because that's what I thought my life looked like forever. Yeah. You're like, fuck that. Yeah. Um, all right. So you don't, don't remember much of that other than that horrible moment. What were the next steps for you? Like at what point, how long were you there before you were stable enough to be moved to either Germany or Walter Reed or. I ended up needing to stay at Walter or at, uh, at Bagram for five, six days before I was stable enough to survive a flight to Germany. Flew to Germany. I was only there uh, about a day. At that point, they amputated my leg up to the knee because infection was the major problem now in terms of my limb. So up to the knee, gone. I was there just one day, and then boom, I'm at Walter Reed. Do you remember much of Germany, or were you out pretty much? No. Yeah. I, don't remember, I don't think I remember any Germany stuff. Yeah. Nothing. I arrived at Walter Reed, and you know my family's there, mother, father, sister, straight into the intensive care unit. I was still I was still dealing with some, with a lot of issues. Mostly it was infection, and I was only at Walter Reed for maybe like seven or eight hours. And the chief orthopedic surgeon comes in, who's still a great friend of mine, and he says, "Hey man, you know I'm Doctor So and So. Here's your situation: your leg is gone up to your knee, and what's left in your thigh is riddled with bacteria and infection, and any one of these infections could kill you." My staff. 
they want to take you down the hall right now into surgery and amputate your leg at the hip and just get rid of this problem and just get you moving on with life. But I think I can save more of your leg. It's just going to be a street fight, and I need you in the fight with me. And I can tell you, I did not process much of what he said to me other than, Hey dude, like, do you want to go get into a fight with me? And I was like, cool, <laughs> let's go do that. You know, so that, and he's like, sign right, me up. Sign me up, I'm in. Yeah. So that began my routine and it was usually three, sometimes four days a week. I was in surgery and they were just incrementally amputating higher and higher piece by piece, cutting out the dead tissue or infected bone or whatever. Antibiotics and then rinse and repeat. You know, I did that for, ended up being like 35, 40 surgeries, something like that. And then. So that's over a course of a couple of months. Yeah. It was about seven, eight weeks. Yeah. That's, that's the way my life was structured. I can only assume, I mean, that amount of trauma to your physical trauma, to your body, like you were, you were pretty doped up that entire time too, right? I mean. Oh yeah. Like do you All remember drugs. really any of that? Or much of it? Yeah, it's it's spotty. I mean, ketamine is a hell of a ride, man. That stuff. I mean, it was like pink elephants flying through the room and shit. Um, is that what you were on most of the time? Yeah, ketamine, Dilaudid, were my two, at least in the in the earlier point phases until I started, you know, weaning off those, and then they threw some opioids at me, you know, whatever. But um, I do have some memories of that, just coming and going from surgery. But most of that is pretty spotty. Yeah. From uh, from where it ends up being um, street fight wise, of it, like, what was the difference between from where they originally said let's just do it at the hip to where it is now? Like how how much was the street fight able to save? Yeah, so my FEMA is about four inches in length, which isn't very long, especially when you're you know six five six six, because that just means you have to have that much more of a prosthetic, and just mechanically it makes things difficult. You know, I have no quad, I have no hamstring, so it's really just bone and some soft tissue. But although uh, I am one that believes that anything is possible, you know, with the right mindset and strategy and, and work ethic and those things, had the doctors done really what the right answer would have been, like the more conservative route, the, it's as close to as impossible as it gets that I would have been able to go back to do what I still do now as a hip disarticulation yeah. amputee. So this doctor and his willingness to take that risk, uh, he gave me my life back. Wow. So the, the four inches of femur makes that big of a difference prosthetic-wise where range of motion, load-bearing, all of those things, it makes all the difference. Yeah, I mean... When it comes to an amputation, it's really not about the loss of the limb. It's about the loss of the joints. Yeah, That's the difference. We can replicate a femur and a tibia pretty easy nowadays, or you wouldn't even notice the difference. It's the ankle, the knee, and the hip. So the difference between being you know, a below-the-knee amputee versus above, those are two entirely different worlds. Yeah, And then the same thing with the difference between being an above-the-knee guy versus a hip dysartic, entirely different worlds. Yeah. So it's is there anybody to your knowledge that is a from a hip uh, standpoint able to go on active like a, do you know of anybody? I don't. I mean, there's not that many above the knee amputees that are still on active duty, right? No. I mean, there's probably a handful. Yeah, now especially nowadays, there's not much. Not many of us left. Yeah. Um, how long was the recovery process from the time that they're like, okay, we've stabilized you as far as not having to continue to amputate. Mm -hmm. So they've, they've got a hold on that from that time until you were able to, to kind of walk around. What was the time frame on that? So I was in March. I was on my first prosthetic in maybe like late July time frame. So like four and a half, five months. Was that primarily just tissue healing? Yeah. 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 So it's got to heal down enough where you can get casted for a socket, which is yeah. what the thing that your leg goes into, like the yeah. bucket your leg goes into. Obviously, if you got like fresh stitches and shit, that's not yeah. going to work. So, you know, it was like it was like three, four, no, probably more like four or five months before I was in my first prosthetic. And that's like a huge moment, right? It's like a major milestone. Yeah. But then I had a couple different revisions I needed to do, surgical revisions, which is quite common. Yeah. They, they got to go back in and clean something up or shave some bone down or, or like whatever the problem is. I had to do that twice. And that's, that's brutal. Cause you hit this milestone and it's like, all right, man, 
I'm going to start getting back at it, you know, back to being a two-legged dude. And then you got to go back under the knife and it like resets like the whole timeline and you wipe that canvas clean and that yeah. setback can be pretty brutal. I can imagine. Have you, uh, I guess, have you been approached or asked um, about the technology of the the uh, threaded rod that goes into your finger? Oh, yeah. Osteo integration. Is yeah. Is that something that you, I guess, would, would that be something that would be good for you to do? Like, would it? improve upon what you're already doing significant enough for it to be worth it yeah it's t it's tough to say that that became a thing literally while i was in walter reed was when they were doing their first trials of that yeah and you know fast forward now you know coming up on a decade um and i'm seeing people i'm seeing people get osteo integration like within months of being an amputee which is amazing yeah to me that like the, the thought of that procedure and and the healing afterward 100% makes my asshole pucker. Yeah. Th like thinking of the what that must feel like and how god awful that has to be to to go through that. I mean go, going through even what you've gone through like hats off to you. It seems uh monumental to get through that and not lose your fucking mind like it, it it's beyond impressive. The thought of drilling a fucking rebar size threaded rod into your femur and then screwing shit onto that. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you do it. Yeah, it's pretty wild. I mean, I guess what choice do you have, right? But, man, is that so is that something you're thinking about? It's something, I, it's not an option. It's not a practical option while I'm still active duty. Yeah. The recovery time is, like, right around two years-ish, like, yeah. if not beyond that. So yeah. I'm just, I'm unwilling to take that much time out of what I do day yeah. to day. Um, and then there's the risk of infection that yeah. also becomes a thing because you got exposed metal. Yeah, that's sticking out of your body like forever. Yeah, I, I mean, to me, if, if physically you're capable of meeting the standard and deploying, it, it doesn't seem like it would make sense to do that. It, yeah, man. I mean, the idea of not having to deal with a socket and the discomfort of a socket. I mean, this thing, you know, first thing in the morning when I put this thing on and everything is exactly where it's supposed to be, it's great. But you know, you start to move, you start to sweat, you like things start to grind, they start to chafe. It's just, it becomes pretty uncomfortable pretty fast. Yeah. The idea of omitting all of that is extremely enticing. So that's the carrot. That is the carrot. It's just, is it worth two years of agony to get there? Yeah, it's, it's a question. Yeah. And most of my, I don't, I don't actually know anyone that's got it done now that has any regrets. Yeah. You know, there's definitely some pros and cons and there's some additional challenges that come with that. But, you know, for me, most of what my FEMA is, is a titanium rod because my FEMA was shattered. It's also really, really short already. If something were to go wrong with that kind of procedure, there's not much left to salvage. Yeah. So then I would end up as a hip dysartic, and now I'm in the realm of, like, not yeah. really using a prosthetic much, if at all. Wow. So it would be a pretty big that risk and gamble. Yeah. Something would have to present itself where it's like, yeah this isn't working for some reason and there's like no practical solution other than that. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so now, uh, you know, years after, did there come a point where it was like, okay, now everything seems pretty normal now, like where, you know, now with, with the prosthesis, it, it seems like there, there, there's not the shock of holy fuck. Like how long did that take from the time, you know, that, that everything happened until it was like, yeah, this is me now and it's I'm normal. not even thinking about it. Yeah. The, or does that ever happen? Yeah, for me, I mean, mentally, uh, that shock of like, oh, my leg's gone. That was that was that didn't take long for me. That was probably a year, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe a year. Um, physically, and just the way I go about living life, there are still times now, which again, is, you know, in March it'll be ten years. There are still times now where I'm like, uh, this is frustrating or I got to figure out how to do this and it's like it's a challenge that I didn't like, anticipate I still dream as a two-legged guy so that's like psychologically I've talked to some some docs they're like yeah that's kind of like an indicator of it when this becomes like normal when this normalizes for you if you start dreaming as an amputee really so yeah which is kind of interesting I mean it makes sense to me I don't usually remember my dreams very often and usually they're, they're pretty horrible but I'm still a two-legged guy when I dream yeah whatever that's worth by horrible, uh, in what way? Is it reliving certain things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, I mean, dream wise, do you relive that day often? Um, or is it just a series of things? 
Yeah, it's usually it's not usually a replay of of this particular event. Um, it's usually more me having like conversations with my detachment commander who was killed the day that this happened, or um, some of the other just like nastier events that we were exposed to. Yeah. No. Yeah. Wow. Um, <clears throat> how long did it take from when it happened uh, until you were physically able to go? you know, back on active duty? Well, I never came off of active duty. Well, yeah, so, I guess the... Um, I was at Walter Reed for a year, and then I returned back to Bragg, back to third group, and I met with the group commander that exact same day, and he said, you know, welcome back, whatever, how you doing, good to see you. Yep, thank you. He's like, what are you, uh, what are you thinking? What do you want to do here? And I told him in that meeting, I'm going back to a detachment. And he did his damn just to keep a straight face, because he was like, okay, roger that. Uh, I'm not sure how we would do that, but it, that's not something we can do right now. I'm like, no, no, no. I have a lot of work I need to do. Like, I was still real, like raw, man. I had a lot to figure out. And, and I'm like, no, 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 I know, but I'm just letting you know like where this thing is going. In the meantime, I'd like to work as a combatives instructor. You know, again, I was big into martial arts and MMA and combatives already. So he's like, yep, perfect. That's your job. Go do that. So I was teaching combatives and CQB stuff. And now I'm going through my med board process with the army who's really trying their damnedest to just have me medically retired. You know, that that's where this was going for them. So I ended up in a fight with the army and I needed a lot of, you know, documentation and exceptions of policy and some senior ranking individuals to put their name on a piece of paper, which in the military, that's usually what it takes to make something happen. Yeah. Just go up high enough, someone sign something. That took eight months. So I'm working as an instructor, I'm training like I'm lunatic. And then once that was complete, I was like, all right, I'm ready. I want to see what do I got to do to get back onto the team? I think I'm ready to give it a shot. And that began real, uh, basic. They were like, cool, go do an army physical fitness test. Just your standardized army PT test. So I do that, come back. I'm like, okay, what else? And uh, they're like, go do, you know, the, the 12 mile ruck. And the, which these are just like standard army physical evaluations that we already have. So they threw a few of those at me. And then you could kind of feel almost the anxiety around the unit where some of our leaders were like, uh, we may actually have to like think <laughs> through what we're doing here. Like this dude keeps like completing these tasks. So there ended up being this meeting. I didn't find out about this for years later, but it was group command team, battalion in my company. And they all sat down and there were some others that, that sat in as well. And they were like, all right, Nick has already completed like this, this, and this. He's not going away. So like, what would we want him to do to demonstrate his capacity to go back onto a detachment? And they just generated this list. And once they decided that this is what it would take for them to be convinced that this was a good idea, they just began throwing these things at me. So I was doing like one or two, maybe sometimes three a week. Just, you know, a lot of it was physical, but then it also included uh, cognitive assessments, proficiency evaluations, uh, another psychological screening. So they really threw the kitchen sink at me. And that whole thing took, ended up being about 12 weeks. Were there any um, tests or criteria that you failed? <sighs> no. So th how was the 12 mile rock? I mean, was that a... That was hard. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was hard. They were all hard. Uh, and some of these weren't like pass fail tests. Some were just like Can you data do collection oh, okay. assessments where they were just like, let's just see like where you're at with this thing. Like some of the cognitive stuff was just like... yeah. Where are you at compared to, you know, your able-bodied teammates? See what, see what that looks like. Were, were there any teammates of yours that showed resistance to what you were trying to do? Or was everybody like, fucking A, let's do this? My entire team was like all out, like, let's go. We, we want you back. And that, that, that is such an important part of this. Because when I first started pursuing this, it was all about me doing what I needed to do, getting back to my lifestyle. I'm going to prove the naysay is wrong. I'm going to prove myself right. I'm going to make the enemy regret not fucking killing me when they had the chance. It was about me doing what I needed to do. I was maybe a two, three weeks into this 
assessment period. And I had a, like a panic attack in the middle of the night because I realized for the first time ever that I was going back to a team. And although I wanted this more than anything, like was that in the best interest of the team? Yeah. And I was around these guys like every day. And still, like I hadn't thought about it that way. And it just like, it scared the hell out of me for one. And then two, I was incredibly guilty. I felt incredibly guilty for having not thought about them. So I go into work the next day I'm still working as an instructor, you know, they're training like normal and I grab all the women that were around. I made phone calls to guys that were off site doing other stuff. And I was like, well, first off, I apologize. Uh, I feel like a complete piece of shit because I haven't even thought about this until now. But have you guys like discussed this? Because to me, it's all just like, let's fucking go. Like you got this. It's all that. But is that just coming out of a place of love because you want to support me because we're bros and you want to see me happy or have you guys really done any kind of analysis into like, if this is a good idea yeah. and they all gave me the same answer, you know, it was like, yep, we've, we've already talked this through. We don't know if this is going to work, but we want to find out for ourselves. We don't want anyone else to decide if this is a good idea. We want to decide. So mm -hmm. if by some chance you can make it back here, we will be the first to tell you if you are a liability or if you are an asset. Mm -hmm. So for one, I was able to put my trust in them and their ability to be objective and look at it logically. Cause I couldn't, cause I was so obsessed with it. It was just like, I had these blinders on. So I was able to put my trust in them to do that. But then in terms of my performance, it just took things to a whole nother level because rather than me going into, you know, my fourth workout for the, of the day, thinking about getting off the bird back in Afghanistan with my arms in the air, you know, flipping everybody off, like that glorifying moment. I was now focused on my teammates, five-year-old son, and I need to destroy this workout, even though I'm exhausted and beat up, I need to do this for him. And when I was able to look at it through that lens, it just sent this surge through me. And now I was operating on a whole nother dimension. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, were there any hiccups or, uh, big roadblocks once you started to get back into the operational environment, were there any things, um, capability wise that you, that you legit struggled with? Yeah, probably all of them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, probably all of them. Most of my training, some of it was kind of tactically focused, but most of it was, you know, done on like the track and in the weight room. And like, that's w w the arenas I was spending most of my time, like bigger, faster, stronger, more agile in those like training environments. When I got back to the ODA, they were already done with their PMT. They, they were set to push out the door like five weeks later. So they were really just doing a couple last minute admin tasks, taking some leave and then pushing out. So I had no time to prep train with them as a one legged dude. And they still brought you in and yeah, <laughs> no shit. Yep. That's fucking impressive. Honestly. I mean, and that says a lot about, uh, the level of trust they had in you, which is only going to be instilled by your work ethic and, and how you made them feel, you know, which speaks volumes. That's fucking incredible. As you guys know, uh, health and fitness is a big part of my daily routine and my lifestyle. I have a number of guests that come on that, uh, you know, that we talk about all, all sorts of things, health and fitness related, uh, diet, nutrition, et cetera. Uh, I started taking athletic greens uh, a few months ago here uh, for that reason is that it's a uh, all all encompassing vitamin and mineral supplement, 75 vitamins and minerals. Uh, it's lifestyle friendly, whether you do keto, paleo, vegan, it's dairy free, gluten free, uh, less than one gram of sugar. There's no uh, GMOs or nasty chemicals. There's no artificial anything in it. Uh, and it's just very nutrient dense and uh, and gives you that that supplementation that you need to combat cold and flu season coming up to bolster your immune system uh, and just help with a, with a healthy lifestyle. Um, right now, the, the subscription, if you sign up for it, comes with a year's supply of vitamin D, which again uh, is, is crucial to uh, immune support, as well as five uh, on-the-go packets uh, with that first purchase. Um, whether you want to invest in, in your health or just supplement an, an already existing protocol that you have, uh, Athletic Greens has been a, a phenomenal staple uh, that I've added into my regimen, and I couldn't be happier to be working with them. Uh, if you want in on that deal, go to athleticgreens.com forward slash mic drop. 
um, and they they do a phenomenal job at uh, all the things that uh, health and fitness um, wise need to be done on a daily basis. So check them out. Go to athleticgreens.com forward slash mic drop and they will hook you up with that uh, special deal. Um, what was it like going back over as a, as an amputee? Yeah, it was certainly, you know, I got that, I got that glorifying moment, which is cool. <clears throat> um, but within a couple days, I realized I had a lot of gaps in my tactical game that needed a lot of work. So it, my celebration was very short lived because now I'm like, oh shit, okay, I got like a lot of stuff I got to do. Simple things, dude, like getting in and out of a Mat V. As a two legged dude, you don't even think about that. You just like bop, 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 and you just jump in. You know, these things are not exactly built for comfort or convenience, they're built for performance. So sometimes you have like a little piece of metal that that's like the step you use to like climb up into this thing. And the first time I went to go do that, I was literally standing there and I just kind of froze. And I'm like, uh, I don't know how I'm going to do this. It just became this unusual challenge that I didn't even think about that was now presented in front of me. And I'm like, okay, let's make a note of that. Let's add that to the list. And I just, you know, much like in, you know, I took a jujitsu approach. It was just drill, 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 drill. until you, you know, for me, find out what the answer is and then just do it a whole bunch of times. And my teammates were awesome about it. They were like competing with me. We'd put, you know, get the stopwatch out. We'd line up two Matt V's next to each other, you know, ready, set, go. And we'd compete like in, out, in, out, in, out. And then I, we'd analyze hey, if I put my left hand here, if I put my right hand there, left foot goes there, I can shave off, you know, a half a second and then just go, 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 go. And I just got real, like real, real scientific with it. I was like, if I do this a thousand times and then I'll be able to do it. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> so what's it going to take for me to do this a thousand times? Like, okay, yeah. I'll do it a hundred times a day, right. For 10 days. Like there's your thousand. Like, so, okay. A hundred times a day based on our op tempo. Cool. Like I need to do it like X times per hour. And like, it was it. It was just like equation I put together that becomes quite simple when you break it down that way. Yeah. And just one task after another, that's yeah. the way I did it. I know that. Yeah. There's been a, a fair bit of kind of research study wise on, the efficacy of building systems versus setting goals. Mm. Uh, and I think that that says a lot about that, you know, goals are, are more vague, whereas systems kind of integrate a path to, to reach that goal. And it sounds like that's kind of, kind of what you were doing, but, um, was there ever an ounce of doubt in your mind? Did you ever have a single solitary moment where, where you thought, fuck, I don't know if I can do this. Any mm. self doubt? Yeah. 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 Can you share a, a moment of that? Yeah, I mean, it probably was a daily occurrence uh, during my days at Walter Reed. Once I began doing like outpatient physical therapy stuff and I was outpacing my headlights every single day and falling flat on my face, both literally and figuratively on most days. And it would be, you know, on the, on the offset of some sort of failure where sometimes I'm literally laying on my face like, Hey man, it, it's just something that you think you can really do that split second of doubt. And I was fortunate to be able to have such a firm grasp on what I needed to do because I know it's who I am that I was able to always have that to grab onto. And that vision was so clear that I could smell it and taste it and, and see it that it was like, I don't know the answer, but I do know I'm not giving myself an alternative. Yeah. So one of two things was going to happen. I'm going to, I'm going to figure this problem out or I'm going to die trying and I'm cool with either of these things happening. Yeah. Wow. Um, so that the first time you went over as an amputee, um, was there a lot of activity operationally? Yeah. Yeah. So that mission, we had a unit known as the Katehas which is the Afghan tier one commando unit um, established by another one of our tiered units that turned them over to us just maybe a year or so prior to that, two years prior to that. So we took them and, you know, these guys were a national, a national response unit. So we were moving all throughout the entire country with these guys. We were based out of one location, but we didn't spend a whole lot of time there which made things exceedingly harder for me because I really didn't get a chance to get into this like routine 
Like, here's where my leg goes. Here's where my stuff goes. I get up. I go to the gym. I go to the ops end. Like, we go prep for ops here because we were in new, new locations all the time. Super dynamic. Very dynamic. Living out of a, you know, tough box or a rucksack for most of that trip. Uh, this is in 2015. So, Kunduz was overtaken by the Taliban. That was a pretty, a pretty big situation. And we responded to that. We relocated there. We spent, you know, a month or so there. Um, so, I, I moved around quite a bit. But we were extremely busy, and when it came to my employment within operations, it was very much a crawl, walk, run methodology that we employed. You know, where we would look at the terrain and all the different things we look at when we're, you know, doing mission planning. And there was just this like extra layer of mission planning, which was, does it make sense for Nick to be here? Yes or no, right? is he an asset on this operation? And if so, like, why? Like, let's take a look at that. Like, what does he bring to the table and where can we fit him in where um, it reduces risk, but more so it increases the likelihood of success, which are two different things. And so I just got real comfortable doing that. Every time it was really hard because no one wants to stay back when the boys go on the bird or on the truck. So that was hard, a pill, hard pill to swallow, but there were times that that happened. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then it just, so it just kind of gradually increased over the course of six months. Yeah. Um, any like fucking world-class gunfights that you got into with, with the leg? Yeah, a bunch. My, my favorite amputee (laughs) gunfight story to tell, uh, is actually was from uh, my next deployment into Somalia in 2016. And we had, uh, we got ambushed. We were, we were dealing mostly with uh, Al Shabaab out there. And we got ambushed. And I was way forward in a razor. I come back, and one of our attachments, uh, one of our PSYOPs guys, was in one of the vehicles that had the mortar system in it. And I had been training him on mortars for quite some time. And I come on, you know, the clean side of the truck, there's some depression. So I come up the back side and, oh, and I open the back seat a door and he's inside the back of the Mat V and, you know, the gunner's just up in the turret. He's just getting it. And, like machine guns are going. And uh, he looks at me with this like panicked look. This is his first engagement ever. And he's like, Nick, like, what am I supposed to be doing right now, man? And I'm like, dude, you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing right now. Just sitting there and like not doing <laughs> shit, right? Waiting for someone to tell you what to do. I'm like, you're good, dude. I'm like, here's what we're going to do. Um, you're going to get out here and we're going to get the mortar. We're going to set it up back here behind me in some low ground and we're going to go to work on the mortars just like I tell you. And he's like, all right, man, let's do it. Get him out, boom, set it up, whatever. I'm aiming, aiming the, the tube. He's hanging rounds. One of our teammates is, is directing us on, on target and, you know, it takes us a few a few walk-ons and fire for effect and gunfight's over. And uh, he's just riding high. Like, it's his first ever engagement. You know, I had been through a, like a whole bunch of things like this. Finish our op, we get back to the house like the next day, and he grabs me the following day, and he's like, he's like, hey man, uh, I talked to my dad yesterday, and I'm like, okay, cool, am I everything good? He's like, yeah, he's like, no, he's a, a former 82nd Airborne Infantryman CSM, and he always gave me so much shit about not going the infantry route. Like he went the psychological operations route. So his dad would always like, I guess, break his balls about that. And he's like, I told him about, you know, the, the fight we got into yesterday and like what I did and, and whatever. And he told me that he's never been as proud of me as he is now. And wow. then this dude I'm talking to, he starts getting like real emotional, you know? And I was like, holy shit, man. You know, and you like live in this world for so long you can get conditioned to just about anything, but then that was just a really cool moment to just yeah. be able to help mentor and like navigate a brand new young kid through something like that. Yeah. I mean, that's a life changing experience for him and his dad, you know, I mean, wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, how many deployments have you been on since uh, becoming an amputee? Uh, five, five, uh, Obviously, one to Afghanistan, one to Somalia. What, what are the rest of them? Um, let's see. Afghanistan, Somalia, um, Iraq, uh, Lebanon, um, and then two other spots. That you can't talk about? Yeah. Yeah. Um, obviously, the two that you can't talk about will wipe off the table. But um, of the of the ones that you can talk about, 
um, was the Somalia one the busiest action wise, or was it Afghanistan or Iraq? Afghanistan and Somalia were definitely right around the same level of busy. Yeah. Um, Iraq wasn't until 21. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, oh. 21. So at, at that point, really, <clears throat> statement as it is now, it's not very yeah. kinetic. Yeah. Um, any actual uh, shoulder fired small arms engagements with, uh, with the amputated leg? Like Kyle G stuff or RPGs? No, uh, sorry, just small arms, man, like r- rifle. Like, have, have you engaged? Oh, anybody? shoulder fire. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like direct. Like direct. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, to me, they're they're in just thinking of it, like it would be impossible for me if if I'm putting my sh- myself in your shoes, not to have a sense of fucking a pride mm. uh, with something like that, and and kind of what you alluded to earlier of the you sh- you should have fucking finished me mm-hmm. off. Uh, does that go through your head uh, at all or often? Yeah, it does. <laughs> Can you talk about it? A yeah, little bit? yeah. Um, maybe just like for you know a split second or two, uh, or if there was like a tactical pause, you can kind of take a minute and your brain kind of wanders for a second. Kind of like, especially when I was in Afghanistan, because yeah, that's where that's where it know, happened. Uh, that's where it happened. So, have you mo- been back to that same area, or were you different spots? We were in a different spot. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, these like <clears throat> brief surges of, uh, you know, like, fuck you. And like, yeah, you should have done the job that you had the chance <laughs> to do. And like now me and my boys are going to make you pay for your yeah. mistake. Yeah. Um, any uh, strange reception from the, especially the, the tier one Afghan unit in seeing you were there any like the fuck, you know, type of reactions from any of those guys? Yeah, I mean, that was the reaction from all of them yeah. initially. Um, but what's cool was the same type of uh, influence that I'm able to give my teammates, where you know they're right around me and I'm fucking going and like getting it, and that can that can be contagious. Yeah, and you can visibly watch everyone else's game like go up, mm-hmm. whether that's because they're like, well, Nick's doing it, so I need to, or if it's just they they feel inspired because of what they're witnessing and they're being around that. Yeah, that same effect w- was hap- happened with uh, really all of the partner forces I've worked with. But in 2015, it was probably the most noticeable. I think probably because it was the first time that I I had been able to see that. But yeah, it's initially like, what are you doing here? You have no business being here. And then cool, like let's go train a little bit. You know, both in the gym and then like tactically, we'll go do tactics or CQB or whatever. And I'm going to be just another guy. And pretty quickly, they're like, oh shit, like this dude can do some stuff. Yeah. So then you watch their eyes kind of open up because they're human beings, yeah. just like any of us, man. And like that same level of inspiration and, and, uh, and influence and effect happened on them, which, uh, which was really cool to yeah. see that. What, what are your thoughts on, <clears throat> on that unit in particular, uh, their level of competency? The Afghan guys. That unit was surprisingly good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they were trained by the very best and they were good and they had all the, they had all the equipment yeah. and it, it, it freaked us out. This is the first time we had worked with this unit. Yeah. And normally, you know, especially under nods, like you can tell where your guys are and where your partner force guys are immediately. Yeah. With these dudes, these guys were all juiced up, you know, and they're <laughs> rocking cry precision and they got like, PBS 31s and they got all the lasers and optics. They got all the same stuff, most of the same stuff that we had. Yeah. And you'd go under nods and you could not tell the difference wow. between your teammates and them. And that is uncomfortable. For, yeah, I can, I can absolutely imagine. I remember uh, kind of a similar feeling, uh, obviously a, a different context, but we operated with the Polish Grom in Iraq. Mm. And it was very similar to that because, you know, this is early 2000s. And it was like not that long ago we'd have been a- opposing these guys. Mm-hmm. And now we're working with them. And, and similarly, like these dudes are these barrel-chested fucking Vikings running around in all the same fucking kit that we are and doing all the same shit. And just like, holy fuck. Yeah. It was kind of uh, kind of creepy. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, were there ever instances for you um, operationally that, that were – um, things that you struggled with or, or things that you couldn't do or, or things that rattled your confidence at all? I 
running on like rocky terrain would freak me out uh, because even with the, all the strength and the endurance capacity, just the way the prosthetic functions sets that to be a really difficult task Yeah, because this knee, which is kind of my primary go-to, this setup, this knee has a little microprocess in it, so a little mini computer. Really? Yeah, and what that does is it regulates and reacts to the amount of pressure that I put through the foot. Wow. And also depending on where in the foot that force is generated. So first the toe versus the heel, for example. Dude, that's fascinating. So the amount of force and where in the foot will tell the knee how fast to articulate or to like lock up entirely. Wow. Does it ever fuck up? Oh, I break these things all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I break these I things. I mean, all does the time. it ever zig when you're when you should zag? Yeah, or? and that that that's an example. So yeah. based on that kind of terrain, if I'm walking on rocky surfaces, it's not a big deal because I have the time to like adjust for what the knee may do. Yeah. Because if I step on a, a rock that I'm not anticipating and it's on where my toe is that's going to tell the knee to do something different because there's now more pressure going through that spot because of the rock Yeah. versus if it was on the heel or the flat part of my foot. So that different weight distribution will tell the knee to do something different. And if I'm running or moving fast on that kind of terrain, then it gets, it can get wonky pretty fast where like every step is like a, is like a reaction. Like, I don't know what my knee is going to do on the next step. Yeah. So that can get a little uh, scary to yeah. do that. You said you break these all the time. Yeah. What do they cost? Do you know? The knee alone uh, is like 80 grand. Holy fuck. This whole setup I'm wearing right now is probably, you know, like a buck 20. No oh, shit. Like that. Yeah. So what is your leg load out on deployment? Like how, how many are you bringing? Because like if you break that overseas, mm -hmm. do, you, do you have several spares? Oh, do you yeah. have like five different fucking setups or what? Yeah. So my normal uh, loadout for legs is typically one entire tough box worth of gear. Yeah. Usually it would be like five or six of these, like my primary go-to, and then like two or three different mechanical backup knees that don't require, because I have to put this on a charger. Oh, right? really? Because there's a computer in there yeah, that requires okay. power. Yeah. There's a battery in this. I mean, one fully charged leg will last me like four days. Wow. So How a couple mechanicals. A um, full charge, maybe like four or five hours. Oh, okay. So overnight. Overnight, yeah. boom, you're good. Uh, so yeah, it'd be a box of legs. And then I got like specialty legs. Like I got stuff for swimming or rock climbing or on a bike or like running, you know. So I have these specialty ones, but then this and a bunch of, a couple mechanicals would be my loadout. And then where I would position all the extras based on the mission we were doing would also change. Oh. So I'd always have one on me, obviously, and then I'd have a mechanical spare that was in like my rucksack or like my go bag. Like yeah. the first thing I would grab if I needed to bail, like I'm bringing an extra leg with me to always have that. Yeah. And then I'd usually have an extra one of these in like the back of my truck and then an extra in another truck in case mine was blown up, I could go somewhere else to get another leg. Oh, okay. This is a stupid question. I'm going to ask it anyway. Is there any uh, Batman, James Bond technology, fucking bayonet knees or any weird shit like that that, uh, that you've seen that's like, Weapon system integrated at all? Uh huh. Really? Yeah. So it's not a dumb question. Can you talk about maybe it? Maybe it is a dumb question, but <laughs> maybe the fact that the answer is yes is just equally dumb. Yeah. When I was in Afghanistan in 2015, first time back as an amputee, there's an organization, I'm sure they still exist, called MTRC, an acronym for something, Mobile Technologies, some shit. And it's a bunch of former team guys that then go become engineers and they go work for this company. And their only job is to like Mad Max solutions to yeah. problems crazy shit and i had an issue when it came to getting on the roof of a mat v uh to deal with a an issue with a potential gun because there's just not a lot of room uh outside the gun this is a truck that has what we'll call a crow system it's basically a uh, a video game version of a machine gun that sits on the roof of this truck so no turret <clears throat> it just is propped up there as a Bravo, all the times I'm dealing with gun problems, I'm like, hey man, if I get on top of the roof at night, there's only like an inch or two of space on either side. Like I can't feel where my foot is. I'm like 25 feet off the ground. I need to be in a much more like stable platform. So I bring MTRC one of these 
I said, the setup. I'm like, this is my setup. Can you get me something where I'm a little bit more like lower to the ground, maybe like a little platform or something I could hook on there? And they were like, sure. I came back like a week later and they had just some of the most ridiculous concepts <laughs> that they had built. One of which uh, was they had, uh, they attached an M203 <laughs> no to shit. my leg, which is a grenade launcher. Uh, and fuck. apparently it actually worked. These really? guys were like lobbing 40 mic mic grenades Dude, that is awesome. with my leg. I'm like, you guys don't seriously think, they're like, no, none of this is actually like practical. But yeah. another well, one had a compartment cool. where you'd slide the leg off and there was a dagger underneath it. Underneath it. God, that's awesome. You could like unsheath a dagger. Yeah. And I'm like, how am I going to stab someone with this? You know, so. <laughs> well, the kickboxing, right? You throw throw some knees in the clinch and it's got a fucking dagger. You impale somebody pretty gnarly. Uh, I guess. Is there uh, a, a singular physical activity that stands out as being the most challenging um, above all else? Physically? Yeah. Po probably posting. squat. Probably yeah. squat, yeah. You know, deadlift, type, deadlift motions are all relatively the exact same. Squat is um, probably the most difficult that I can yeah. think of. Is that something you still try to do a lot of with both legs, or are you just one, one like one like a deadlift kind of thing? Yeah, I do both. Yeah, really? Yeah, I do both. Most of my two-legged back squats are done off of a box now. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll go off of a box. Yeah. I mean, is that trying to develop like your ass and, and lower back or, or what? Um, I mean, because if there's no, because you don't have a, a quad or a hamstring, right? Nope. At least not on that side. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a good question. I say, I you know, I squat now the same for the same reasons I squatted when I had two legs. It's yeah. A, it's a good movement. It's one we do every day. I mean, when I get off this couch right now, I'm going to be doing a squat. So yeah. you're not getting around squatting yeah. if you're going to live like in a normal lifestyle. So yeah. one, it's just part of being a human. And two, it, it builds, you know, yeah. strength and durability yeah. and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> all right. So for for your personal life, if you don't mind uh, delving into that for just a minute, at what point did Tony, the, the good friend, become Tony, the romantic interest during this process? We, we became each other's... Uh, source of strength during that deployment, even though we were in two different locations. Yeah. So just like via phone calls and, you know, email stuff. And when I was at Walter Reed, you know, she began coming to visit me when I was, when I was up there. And then once I was able to get mobile, you know, I'd bomb down to, to Fort Bragg area to see her. So our like courting phase was at a point when mo usually you're trying to put your, the, best showing forward right like <laughs> yeah. all the expensive dinners and the yeah. nice outfits and the whatever the brochure right yeah. the sales pitch is coming <laughs> in hard uh for me and really well for us uh, you know i was at like my lowest point uh was was the onset of our relationship as something beyond friends that, that says uh and speaks exceptional volumes on her character unbelievable yeah, that's amazing yeah, you know, and, and it set us up for success in a lot of ways because yeah. of the way things began, like really rough time and, you know, her strength and willingness to, you know, not only support me, but just be like an enormous asset to me mm -hmm. and be like on this journey with me as a teammate set us up for success long, yeah. long term. Yeah. Um, Do you ever ask her what the fuck she was thinking? <laughs> Or is it that I'm going to use a third uh, Back to the Future reference, or was it a Florence Nightingale effect? <laughs> uh, we've had the conversation because it's it's come up in like other interviews and stuff I've done. Uh, because when I when I set my sights on going back to the team, which again was done at Walter Reed, when I left Walter Reed, I moved in with her, and I was living there with her in her house for maybe a week or two. And I realized for me to have any shot at making this real, I was going to have to literally burn the boats and literally discard everything else that didn't need to be there. It was going to be, you know, eat, sleep, train, repeat. And like, that was it. And I sat her down and I was like, Hey babe, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going back to the team. And she's like, yeah, no, I know. I'm like, well, what I think that looks like on the ground, like day to day is there is no like, weddings. There will be no dinners. There will be, if someone dies, I'm not going to the funeral. Like this is all I, I will be doing. And I understand if you don't want to be a part of this. And you know, her response was okay. Like I'm, I'm good. Like, let's do this, you know? So wow. obviously I look back with just an enormous amount of gratitude for her strength and vision. Cause I look at the life we have now with two small boys and um, we're, we're both very blessed and all that 
probably should have not existed if I was if I was talking to a more rational human. But you know, she's she's like a little female version of me, and th- we've had this conversation because at times I've reflected on that. Like, well, what did make you like want to be around for that? And you know, one is like she could see where things were going with us, which, which is true, but she was also dedicating herself to some pretty uh, unprecedented uh, moves in her professional career. So we were both kind of in this hyper work focused space at the same time, kind of going down these roads, but we were able to do that in tandem as a, as a unit, which definitely played a role Yeah, in that. Can you talk at all about what, professionally what kind of pivot she made or is that uh, did she stay in yeah she stayed in um but the details of it no yeah well enough said i guess right mm-hmm. um is she still in now or can you yeah. yeah um how does that work with having two boys and you're both still <laughs> in i mean what how do you guys fucking balance that yeah we have a with amazing family <clears throat> support dynamic around us uh when we first got pregnant with dom our oldest my mother-in-law was set to retire and she just decided to relocate to be full-time grandma oh, and help wow. us with him. Yeah. So we bought our house knowing she was going to move in. So she had her own like grandma wing, Yeah. Uh, which was the only way this would have worked because when our oldest was six months old, both her and I, both Tony and I both deployed at the same time. Wow. Two yeah. different, two different AOs. So we were both gone from when he was six months to, you know, around 12 months. And then, uh, you know, we got blessed with our second and my mother was then ready to do the exact same thing. Wow. So we, we got her set up down by us. So actually now my mother looks after our youngest during the day. Our oldest is in kindergarten. And now, I mean, I left the team life, you know, like four or five months ago. Yeah. And she's about to start her retirement. So both her and I are done with the uh, like high oct tempo, like detachment type life. Yeah. So it's a much more predictable and yeah. more normal lifestyle. Yeah. What uh, so What are you doing now then? I'm a company operations warrant. Oh, okay. So I work alongside a company commander and company sergeant major. How is that uh, for you personally with such a shift dynamic wise uh, going from turning and burning for so long? Yeah. Being the, the boots on the ground guy to to not be in that. To be in the, the yeah. admin How riding the desk. Yeah. It was hard, man. Yeah. yeah, it was hard. I got back from Iraq, uh, and the writing was on the wall. And, you know, I mean, 15 years it takes its toll on anybody, no matter how many limbs you have. When you've been doing doing that for almost a decade on one, that it, it speeds up that clock in a lot of ways. There's a lot of compensation that my body's doing that God really didn't intend for it to be worked that way, yeah. used that way. And I got back from that trip, and... It just got to a point where for even just a simple, you know, three, four hours on a flat range, I was having to do, you know, like 45 minute warm ups and like all these crazy cool downs and, but all the foam rolling and the band work is just at some point, like you're going to break it down faster than you can keep it together. Talk to my docs, ortho, physical therapists. They're all like, dude, how much longer are you going to keep doing this? Because if you keep living this way, you are going to need both your hips replaced, your knee, you know, but you can save that if you stop now yeah. and drastically shift your lifestyle. Yeah. Because the way I trained, I had to train with that type of intensity to stay on the team. Yeah. Like I'm running alongside 24-year-old studs. <clears throat> yeah. So I have to be training at least twice as hard, if not three and more often. And just like, that's what it took. So I'm like, <sighs> This is the, this is about the time when I need to yeah. hang it up and look, look at the next thing. Yeah. yeah. At what point did the objective secure book idea come in and, and where did it stem from and how did it all come to fruition? It stemmed from a single moment in time when I was sitting there alongside General Cleveland, who was the USASOC commander in 2015 when I got back from a deployment, my, my deployment as an amputee and, you know, I got really thrust it into the spotlight a lot, a lot of ways. You know, this hadn't happened before. So the Army and SOCOM and USASOC wanted to highlight, you know, what we did collectively. And I understand that. It's, it's, it's solid messaging. I wanted nothing to do with that, though. Like, at any point, if anyone tried to treat me like anyone 
different than a regular team guy. I, I did not like that. Joe Cleveland at one point asked me to be a part of this engagement with some decision makers out of Washington because our strength and conditioning program was lobbying for an increase in budget. And I politely declined. <laughs> and then I was politely reminded that when a general asks you to do something, he's not really asking you <laughs> shit. Like, get your ass over there and, and do good. So I did that. And, and then he pulled me aside after and was like, hey, man, I know you that you don't want to do this. You don't want to be here. You want to do your job. And I respect and appreciate that. But you have an obligation, as far as I'm concerned, to share the lessons you've learned, the things you've been through, how you're able to do that. And it's not about you. It's about someone else who's struggling with something similar or just some other type of adversity. And that was the, that was the initiation of kind of a paradigm shift for me. It was very slow and gradual, but I began getting out there, you know, into social media a little bit. And then the questions came coming in. And usually it was just, how did you do what you did? And I got that question, you know, eventually thousands of times. And I was answering them one at a time, boom, boom, boom. At one point, I just sat down after doing this for years, and I said, this is wildly inefficient. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to answer that question, and I ha so I'll have that product, and then I'll, just I'll be able to copy, paste, and send it rather than doing this individually. So I sat down for maybe a week, and I just thought about the answer to that. Like, how did I do what I did? And I really hadn't thought about it that much before, but I started reading through some of my journals, training logs, talked to some teammates, and created what ended up being like an eight or nine page just Word document, like phase one, phase two, phase three. Like this is the answer to your question. And I used it that way for probably three, four years. And uh, it worked. You know, the feedback was tremendous. I was like, cool, mission accomplished. Like we're good to go. June of 2020. Now I'm in dive school down at Key West. This is now like peak COVID time, which is a key part of this story i'm at key west getting my ass kicked going through dive school and one of my really good buddies we played football together in college been close friends over 20 years now he he calls me out of the blue and usually when he would call me or i would call him it meant there was like a problem that needed to be dealt with usually it's just hey man text message you good i'm good cool later phone rings it's him his name's eric and i'm like oh shit okay what's up you know what's up dude he's like how you doing i'm like not great i'm getting killed down here i'm hanging on by a thread but i'm fine relatively i'm like what's the problem he's like no no, no there's no problem but i think you need to write a book <laughs> just like that and i'm like what I'm like dude first off no and two i'm in no condition to have this kind of conversation with you i'll talk to you later click hang up I finish dive school I get back home he calls me again re-engages again i said you know what dude all right let me just like think about what you said just out of respect to you and, you know, it's July of 2020. The gyms are closed. The fight house is closed. We're doing this weird, you know, half on, half off work schedule, with six feet separation. You know, like people are trying to figure out how to stay productive when we can't go to work. Weird time for all of us, right? But I have all this extra time and energy on my hands that I otherwise would have spent working or in the gym or whatever. So I'm like, you know what? Let's just see what happens. And I have this Word document that I've been using really as, a, as an outline. So I just said, this is it. And I'm just going to add to it and just see what happens. We were going into Iraq in December of that year. So I gave myself that window just to see what I would, could come up with. And within just a couple of weeks, I became obsessed with it, which is weird. Because if I was writing anything prior to that point, it was because I had to whether it was for work or for school or for something. I did not enjoy writing. But once I decided to do this, I found myself really in love with it. And I just got obsessed to the point where there were times I'll, I was jumping out of bed at 2 o'clock in the morning because I just had to go write. And fast forward just like 90 days, it was maybe like early November, and I'm sitting on 75,000 words. And it's like, holy shit, what just happened? Was it cathartic writing for you? Very much so. Yeah. Yeah. And did you go through uh, a self-publishing kind of process, or did you go yeah, yeah. self? Mm -hmm. um, it's it's funny hearing you kind of chronologically outline that because the exact same thing happened with that unfuck America book. Really? Yeah, I mean, like to a T. Uh, COVID shutdown happens. Now, granted, I'm obviously been out for a while, but you know, running a business and things have changed, and 
everything's fucking closed. It's like, well, the kids are home at school from school. I'm basically stuck here, so I guess I'll uh, do Zoom one-on-one private lessons with people. I'll work out a lot, and I'll write a fucking book. And, yeah, I mean, same same kind of fucking well, thing. It's weird. Yeah. Um, man, that's wild. And it's a lot of people leverage the, the COVID times. Yeah, to and, Netflix you know? and fucking Instacart and, and uh, DoorDash and whatever right. and, and fucking complained about everything. Mm-hmm. No, I know it. I mean, I, to me, there's just essentially two types of people. There's heroes and victims or, you know, go-getters and not go-getters, you know, maybe not hero and victim. But, you know, there's people that will take advantage of, of a shitty deal in terms of taking a break. And there's people that will say, okay, that here's the cards I've been dealt. How can I maximize this uh, to the best of my ability opportunity-wise? To me, I mean, it's kind of that simple. Yeah. You know, there's, there's really two types of people that fall into one of those two fucking categories. But... Um, that's awesome. Was uh, I know your buddy Eric said that? How was the command? How was their reception to you writing the book and, and being okay with it? Totally fine. Completely supportive uh, on the on the exterior. You know the the quiet professional mentality is one that runs deep in our in our community. So way were, more so than my community. I guess. Yes, absolutely true. Yeah. Um, there were actually times where were like, "What are you? Are you trying to be a seal?" <laughs> Uh, which you know, just a fair laugh. point. And and, <laughs> and really, I tell this to my buddies. There's not really much of a difference between a special forces dive team and like the seals. Like yeah. you guys are all the exact same cliche things that we yeah. talk talk shit about. Like Ranger panties, yeah. frosted tips, visible abs. <laughs> I haven't seen you wear a shirt in six weeks. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so there was definitely some of that, uh, which I was prepared for. But overall, it was <clears throat> no nah, man like. I think that that's awesome. Yeah. Like I had to figure out what protocol looked like to how to get it approved to yeah. be able to do that, you know, and that was tough to navigate because most people just didn't know. They're like, I don't know. So I just took some phone calls and blind emails and like, hey, this is what I'm trying to do. What's the right way to do it? I want to make sure I do this the right way and blah, yeah. blah, blah. So I did all that. You know, I had to get the manuscript approved out of the Pentagon, which only took maybe like, I don't know, it was like three or four months. Yeah. And I moved kind of quick. I was kind of surprised. Yeah. I mean, has there been any backlash? Because, I mean, you've you've done some pretty big interviews, the book, your social media presence is significant. Has there been any anybody that's kind of, you know, had a bad taste in their mouth as it relates to that? Yeah. 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 And I've, I've had a chance to have some conversations with about them, which I respect and, I, you know, I appreciate. I have modified my interpretation of what it means to be a quiet professional. And I, I, I believe there's a difference between quiet and silent and – I know where my integrity is. I know where my morals are. I know why I did this. I know why I do what I do, and I sleep fine at night because of that. Yeah, you're entitled to your opinion. And I respect that um, entirely. The greatest piece of backlash I get or negative criticism is people expect or want this to be an autobiography. Yeah, they're like, I want like the stories. I want your story, man. Because the, while there's vignettes in there and examples, there's just enough in there to try to put the reader into the context of what I was experiencing when I realized the importance of, you know, discipline, structure, work ethic, like that's the point of this project. The stories are there just to highlight this. So I guess that's, that's good criticism. That's good negative criticism. Like people want the story. Yeah. uh, Which this very much is not. Yeah. That makes good sense. Uh, Is there a, a question in any interview that you've not been asked that you wish you had. So I'm going to let you do my job here. That's the lazy way out. Any question that I've not been asked that, that you, I wish I had that you wish somebody in a public platform had asked you. Oh my gosh. Um, you can't say no. I know. Uh, let's see. I don't think I've been asked this. So I'll, th- I'll throw this out there. Um, I don't even know how I would frame the question, but the question would come in the form of something about, you know, now that you're a father, you got two kids, but you're still, you know, like going at it, living in this lifestyle. Do you feel like maybe you have an obligation to them to like do something different, maybe something less dangerous or something less time consuming or like whatever it is. Um, and this is on my mind, one of my more recent like journal entries, I was kind of just like thinking through this. And, you know, while I can appreciate that sentiment, uh, I'm very much looking forward to it. And actually I need 
to be in a position where once my oldest is old enough to recognize what I'm saying and appreciate what I've lived, when I tell that kid, you know, you can be anything you want to be, you can do anything that you want to do, anything you set your mind to is possible. I have to have lived that. I have to have demonstrated that. It can't just be like a facade, or these hollow words or a bumper sticker slogan. Yeah. I need to be prepared for that kid to then turn around and go, well, is that what you did? Yeah, because I can tell you when they're teenagers, you can rest the fuck assured they'll see through anything right. that, that way or even before that, you know, because you're not going to snowball them. And, I mean, obviously the life you've lived and the experiences you've had, you know, that, that's a pretty easy um set of dots to connect I, I think for that explanation to a child to to tangibly get that and to kind of walk the walk and um you know and, and showcase that yeah I, motherfucker i have i have and you, you can you can see me and, <laughs> and yeah. look at it but yeah in that same vein uh, i know you had both your children after uh you know after the incident but it has do you view fatherhood any different now post amputation than you did prior to the only uh, the only thing i can think of that comes to mind is like pre wasn't so much pre-injury but really ironically right around that time um this was mostly triggered because of my now wife but prior to that like i wanted to live this like samurai warrior lifestyle or, like this is all i did the idea of having kids like was never an option, never really on my mind. Really? Yeah, man. Like I wanted to live this like f almost fictitious warrior lifestyle. Yeah. Fucking Ronan. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's impossible to, to crystal ball it, but do you think that you would have had kids had you not? Had I not? Seven? <sighs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But what I do know is... Again, we keep going with the Marty McFly, but <laughs> another reason why I, you know, if I, if I could go back and undo this and miraculously my leg is back on, you know, the butterfly effect could, could in theory be very real. You know, what would you, would I risk undoing anything? You know, the answer is no, because if there's even a chance that what I have now in terms of my family doesn't exist, then that's a non starter. Yeah. I mean, that, that says uh, everything you need to know. You know. Um, I've got a couple of just random questions that uh, that I've written down as we've had this talk that I'd uh, like to throw your way, and, and they are completely fucking random. Cool. Um, from a nutrition, drinking, like how dialed in uh, is, or how important is it for you to dial in, and how dialed in is your nutrition and, and what you eat, drink, consume, bed routine, morning routine, all of those things. Like, is that something for you that like, it's gotta be super meticulous and, and I don't stray from it for you to be able to function the way that you do? At, at this stage, um, I do prefer to live in a place of structure where I know exactly what I'm gonna be eating and what I'm gonna be doing in the gym 12 days from now. That's my comfort place. Uh, so I do keep things pretty meticulous, but it's not nearly as rigid as it has been at times in the past. Yeah. There's even in objective secure, I outline what a, what a regular day looked like for me just by the minute, like boom, 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 boom. I did not stray from that. Um, I won't say under any circumstances, but that's how I lived like 99 days out of a hundred because I was willing to forego everything else. Yeah. Nothing else mattered. Um, today, me an entirely different place. Priorities have moved around. I have a little bit more, you know, adaptability and flexibility and strategically built in there yeah. where I can, I can make up a, a thing or two here, there, if I need to. But if I start to live just kind of totally spontaneously, I, I get really uncomfortable pretty fast. Yeah. You know, nutrition wise, um, pretty, pretty clean dial in. Yeah. It stays dialed in. Like I know what my daily calorie intake is. I know what my macros are. Um, and when was the last time you had McDonald's? Oh my God. Or any fast food. Like just garbage fast food. I couldn't. I don't know. Years? I don't know. Yeah. It's, it, yes. Definitely. Yes. Is, is there a guilty pleasure food wise that like a couple times a month a pizza or like Italian? Italian. Yeah. I mean, I grew up Italian. Yeah. Uh, What's and, the favorite? 
my wife makes a homemade gnocchi that will knock your balls off. Is that right? It's unreal, <laughs> dude. Yeah. Well, I don't need them, so maybe I should have that sometime. Uh, that's fucking great. Uh, it, it, was there a, a tradition, an Italian food tradition growing up that... Uh, Family dinners on Sundays. Was it always different, or were there a couple of staple things that... Yeah, ziti meatballs was there every, every, every single every time. time. My grandmother... Yeah. It's like some shit straight out of Sopranos, man. I love it. She would start cooking her gravy on, like, Friday, <laughs> and we would eat on Sunday. Oh, man. I love Unreal. That. Yeah. yeah. That's so cool. I love it. Uh, from a Brazilian jiu-jitsu adaptation standpoint, mm. um, how, how... I mean, obviously, it, it affects and impacts how you do it. I'm assuming it's sans uh, prosthetic. Correct. Because uh, I mean, nobody's heel-hooking your fucking prosthetic limb right so yeah and then this thing starts whipping around yeah. it becomes a weapon for everybody yeah so i mean there is, is there an advantage like have you ever tried rolling with it i have yeah and, and is, that, is it more trouble and it's good or, or can you use it because i mean realistically right like let's say you get an, into an altercation mm -hmm. are, are you gonna just go at it or are you gonna take the time to fucking try to take it off or what like how long does it take to to take that off yeah like, so could you pop it off quick enough you can actually, and now my current setup here is I could get this thing off and be into my jujitsu setup in like two seconds yeah. if I needed to. Okay, um, but I've 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 trained especially when I was working as a combatives instructor, you know, full on like MMA style with the leg on just for like real life yeah. stuff, not for competition or anything like right. that. But like, how does it change if I have this thing on? And it certainly does. Yeah, um, yeah, because you know, like you're in a movie, you know, and somebody grabs a hold of you, or you know, fucks with one of your kids, or, or whatever, and like you're not, hey, hang on one second, you yeah, know, so you're time. just going going into it. That mm -hmm. changes how you how you adapt, right? Yep, hundred <clears throat> uh, percent. Was it a huge shift um, in training that way? Like, were there a lot of things, kind of like you're talking about dreaming with two legs? Mm. If you've got years of training with two legs, you're trying to triangle somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, like, fuck, I can't do that now. Like, mm -hmm. how how big of a um, shift, both mentally, physically, and, and, like, how long did it take before you kind of made that subconscious adaptation to be able to do it uh, with one leg? Yeah, <clears throat> because it's as difficult as it is to learn the new techniques, you have to unlearn years of what has become reactive yeah and that gets tough yeah um, which is just done through drilling and, and like repetition and whatnot uh it took it, it took me maybe a few months because i started doing jujitsu at walter reed there was a local black belt that used to come to the hospital and do a day a week yeah that's awesome with us and then uh he allowed me to train at his studio once i got to a point where i could you know leave the hospital and go out and do things so i was training there that's where really my like ruggedness began to get kind of somewhat buffed out a bit so by the time i got back to brag and i was working with my guys i kind of ironed through a lot of that stuff especially mentally um, because i very quickly realized that while i no longer have a closed god in the traditional sense there's a lot of advantages that i actually have oh i can imagine can is there one in particular that stands out the one that stands out the most is just the fact that jiu-jitsu is a weight class sport yeah and you just know, like with wrestlers with one leg sometimes it's like they're in a 133 pound weight class, but they're they're built like a 177 pounder or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Same thing. If you looked at me versus some of the people I've competed against from the waist up, you'd be like, "There's no way you guys <laughs> yeah. are in the same weight class." But yeah. I'm missing 45 pounds of leg. So yeah. just from a competitive standpoint, there's that. Yeah. And then also knowing that you know most people I train with and or that just train jujitsu in general are training against people with four limbs. So yeah. as I go to transition or swing or move. They're going to catch that leg and it's not it's there, not there yeah. and they just come up with air and i'm already gone yeah you know so i realized that pretty quick which became really fun to play around with like how can i <laughs> how can expose I trick fuck that? this guy yeah. yeah it became fun that's wild uh is tom brady a traitor no no what do you think i mean he's a businessman yeah i mean i'm right there with you but there's a lot of people from where you're from that don't view it that way and we are passionate up north. <laughs> I know it. Business I mean, decision. The, uh, uh -huh. the, the Jews mind it. Yeah. Um, that's good shit. Uh, so what now and kind of what do you see you doing moving forward long term? Yeah, so like I said, I'm in this new cow position, company ops warrant position. Uh, I got a lot to learn there as well, which is surprisingly fulfilling, dude. I mean, I would have sworn that I'm going to hate whatever I do next for the rest of my career. I'm just going to be miserable for the next four years or whatever. 
but it's actually quite fulfilling. You know, when you move up uh, in leadership or at echelon, your span of influence gets broader. So you get a chance to touch more individuals throughout the unit outside of just, you know, a 12 man team. So it's actually pretty cool. I got a lot to figure out on how to do that well and lead from a, you know, next level position. Um, and then I got outside of uniform. That's also something that is, is a passion project for now, but I know that that's what I'll do full time once I'm no longer serving in the uniform. Yeah. So where a lot of guys, service members in general, they struggle with transition. It's a giant void to try to fill. I'm in a position where I, I already have identified what my next purpose is, and I actually can begin grinding towards that now and making a lot of mistakes on that now and learning and, and surrounding myself with, you know, the right people to help push me and, and guide me. So that's what my future looks like. Yeah. It's, you know, it, it's in a lot of ways, it's the same thing I do now. Like Special Forces Warrant Offices in particular, we got a lot of tasks and responsibilities, but we're advisors. Yeah, and mentors. And mentors. Yeah. We advise decision makers. That's the reason why we exist. Yeah. Uh, so through that lens, I'll, I'm essentially doing the exact same thing, just in the public sector. Yeah. You know, so I'll continue to write. I, I told you I, I fell in love with writing when I did OS, and I'm working on my next few projects now, writing, but then, you know, speaking and consulting and those kinds of things, that's – where we're going, man. I assume I know the answer. Uh, any fiction in your future? Writing? Back to the Future 4, <laughs> since we're talking about it. I would be surprised if I decided to do a fiction piece. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Yeah. Um, well, good stuff. Uh, is there anything that you would like to uh, bring up, uh, mention, or talk about before we wrap up? Because I do have a gift for you that I want to uh, give give to you on, on the show. <sighs> Let's see. What's uh? Yeah, I'll, I'll mention I mentioned the book and, and writing. The, the primary focal point for that initiative, or those, that side of our company, is the uh, the workbook version of Objective Secure. So I'm currently working on that now, which will be available in physical form as well as digital. Um, just a much more user friendly way for those to extract the guide and the principles and to put them into use. So. I think that'll probably be good in, I don't know, maybe April, May time frame. So, is that um, one where almost kind of like uh, I don't know if you've seen like the panda planner type journals where it's it's one where like you'd go through it every year, or is it kind of a one and done? I see it as not not so much of a journal, but a way to through models and graphs and certainly the written form take these different aspects within this methodology and just make it so it's a little easier to comprehend, but then you have that physical product to leverage to actually do some of that stuff. So okay. I think it's something that you could circle back to, even if you've, you've been successful achieving this goal, you can still use the same thing and just reapply how you're using it. Yeah. I guess just thinking of it purely from the entrepreneur business standpoint, if there's, if there's a way to make it a, a consumable item, Right, you know, like if it, if it, if it's dated, you know, and this is this is your twenty three workbook, and this is your twenty four workbook, mm -hmm. and then you're, I'm not trying to give you business advice, but please just, do, um, you know, but then then it's like, hey, here's the twenty three, the twenty four, like every year there's a new one, yeah, and and it's you know maybe there's some some refreshes, some addendums, whatever, but then it's for the rest of your fucking life. This is it. You're putting out it, whether it's a desktop one, whatever, like, every, like every year you're putting it out. Yeah, you know? I like it. Thanks uh, for that, bro. Yeah, absolutely. So what I'm here for is uh, oh, not much, but the, uh, so th there's a, a company called champions choice, silver, uh, CCS, uh, and, a, and a buddy of mine, John Johnston out in, uh, in California that has, uh, very, very graciously offered to, uh, provide these, uh, kind of parting swag gifts for, uh, all guests on the mic drop, uh, episode here. So I wanted to present this to you. Very cool. Um, on the top there is kind of the the cursory coin it's got the mic drop logo on the front and just my business one of my businesses logos on the back uh but then for you uh, especially where you're stationed uh you know, this may may play a good role for where you're at oh damn dude is it buckle yeah <laughs> yeah and if you want to show it to the camera it's got uh, hell yeah uh, the, the greeny beanie uh 
I say the buckle. This thing's a weapon. Yeah, well, fucking, which it is, is also it's, it's, really cool. It's uh, you could you could throw it in a plate carrier too, maybe you know. But, Holy uh, shit! Yeah, very so, generous, man. Well, I mean, all thanks go to to CCS and and John Johnston. I mean, they're the ones making that happen. It was their idea. They approached me, and I was like, "Fuck, man, I don't I don't even know what to say other than thank you." But uh, those guys have been wow. amazing, and and uh, you know, being able to give give uh, the amazing guests something to to take away, I think, is pretty special. So very cool, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, uh, I, I appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule. I know you're busy as hell, especially being on active duty, and you're doing a lot of things while you're here. So uh, for you to to take the time to come sit down, I know you've been interviewed a number of times, and and sometimes that's challenging to bring a a fresh perspective or an interview that's different than the ones that you've done. I, I hope that I've done that in some way, but. Um, I, again, I can't thank you enough for coming and uh, sharing your story. It's it's amazing. It's inspiring. Uh, your family sounds incredible, and I uh, wish you nothing but the best moving forward with uh, with all the things you have going on. I appreciate it, brother. Yeah, thanks, thanks for, for having me, man. Absolutely. Thank you. For those of you guys, uh, I know that you enjoyed this. Even if you try to lie to yourself and tell you you didn't, you can choke yourself. You know that. Uh, I appreciate the support. Uh, show after show, week after week, month after month. And uh, we've got some uh, some new shows coming, uh, you know, over the next couple of weeks and months that uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy. But uh, again, I just want to say uh, thank you to you guys for uh, for supporting this show. We wouldn't be able to do what we do without you guys. So uh, appreciate you. Until next time, this is Mike Drop.